This is an ABC News Live special report. The death of George Floyd, Derek Chauvin on trial. Hi everyone, I'm Diane Macedo here with Terry Moran and we're coming on the air with breaking news. We've just learned the jury has reached a verdict in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin charged in the death of George Floyd. Derek Chauvin is accused of killing George Floyd by restraining him and kneeling on his neck for more than nine minutes. He's charged with second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. And we'll explain those in just a minute. Now, the jury is deliberating this case. They're comprised of 12 jurors, six are white, four are black, two identify as multiracial. We know five of those jurors are men, seven are women, with ages ranging from in their 20s to being in their 60s. They are the people responsible for determining a verdict in this case, and now we know they have. Now, yesterday, the prosecu prosecution and defense combined gave more than six hours of closing arguments. The prosecution encouraged the jury to believe their eyes and what they saw on that nine-minute bystander video of Chauvin's knee on Floyd's neck and emphasized the message that Chauvin knew better, he just didn't do better. Only you have the power to convict the defendant of these crimes and in so doing and in so doing declare that this use of force was unreasonable it was excessive it was grossly disproportionate it is not an excuse for the shocking abuse that you saw with your own eyes and you can believe your own eyes this case is exactly what you thought when you saw it first, when you saw that video. It is exactly that. You can believe your eyes. It's exactly what you believed. It's exactly what you saw with your eyes. It's exactly what you knew. It's what you felt in your gut. It's what you now know in your heart. This wasn't policing. This was murder. The defendant is guilty of all three counts, all of them, and there's no excuse. That was Prosecutor Steve Schlischer. In response, Derek Chauvin's attorney, Eric Nelson, focused the jurors' attention on the burden of proof here. Beyond a reasonable doubt, all 12 of them must be convinced of the prosecution's case beyond a reasonable doubt. And then in a long, long, exhaustive review of the evidence, he tried to find that doubt for them in the cause of death, an ambiguous autopsy report, in what he said were Derek Chauvin's lawful actions given the circumstances, lawful uh, under Supreme Court precedent and according to his own training. And then at the end, Eric Nelson came back to that burden of proof. All of this, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, all of this, when you take into consideration the presumption of innocence, the presumption of innocence and proof beyond a reasonable doubt, I would submit to you that it is nonsense to suggest that none of these other factors had any, any role, that is not reasonable. And when you, as members of the jury, conclude your analysis of the evidence, when you review the entirety of the evidence, when you review the, the law as written, and you conclude it all within this, all within a, a thorough, honest analysis. The state has failed to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. And therefore, Mr. Chauvin should be found not guilty of all counts. And that, of course, is the choice before the jury. They have reached their decision and will be issuing their verdict uh, in a little while. Let's bring now uh, our guests and Kenneth Moten, a reporter on the scene in Minneapolis. Once again, Leah Wright Rigur and legal analyst Terry Austin. And Kenneth, let me ask you, uh, what's the scene there like? Is there is there surprise? The jury, uh, you know, deliberating seems about 10 hours. Uh, what's the reaction? 
Terry, we got that alert from the courts about 30 minutes ago, and I can tell you the energy kind of picked up around this city. We are downtown right now, just a few blocks away from the courthouse. That courthouse is surrounded by National Guard troops, surrounded by, fence, by fencing as well, perimeter fencing, and uh, this city is ready. Uh, we've been anticipating this. Uh, we did not think it would come this quickly. Uh, we know that, again, the jury deliberated for about four hours last night. They went about a half hour past what they were supposed to, and then they picked up a half hour early this morning and spent uh, several hours, so a total combined about 10 and a half hours deliberating uh, inside this uh, Hennepin County Courthouse. We know that George Floyd's family is on the way to a downtown hotel where well, they'll be watching this verdict inside a room. We are told by this family that they are in good spirits and they are ready to hear this verdict. Felonis Floyd, George Floyd's brother, was on uh, national TV this morning during an interview saying he is, again, optimistic about this verdict. He felt good about the state's case. He felt good about those closing arguments. He felt good about those state witnesses, from the bystanders to the expert witnesses, the medical experts who took that stand over the course of this three-week trial and testified about what happened to his brother when Derek Chauvin dug his knee into George Floyd's neck at 38th in Chicago. Again, we understand a crowd is gathered at 38th in Chicago where this incident happened on May 25th. We also understand that near the courthouse, very close to the courthouse grounds, there's a section for demonstrators. There's a growing crowd there as well. We have seen demonstrations in the city several days over the course of this trial. Last night, we saw protests. Over the weekend, we saw protests. Some of those demonstrations turned violent as well because of incidents that had happened in near, a neighboring and nearby Brooklyn Center as well. And so we know this city, this region, the state is, has a state of emergency right now. The governor declared a state of emergency because of what is expected from this verdict. Uh, they are anticipating it. Businesses are boarded up. Uh, there are, again, thousands of National Guard troops, increased police security because this city is preparing for what those jury has handed down. And, and Terry Austin, I want to go to you because we now know, uh, as Terry mentioned, Derek Chauvin is charged with second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, and manslaughter in this case. And, and the jury issuing a verdict means they have found a decision on each of those counts. And those decisions could be the same, they could be different for each count. But walk us through what the jury has to consider to reach a decision on each of those charges. So, Diane, for the second degree murder, that's the unintentional murder while committing the assault. And so they have to think about the fact whether or not there was an assault. When the mm -hmm. judge talked about the elements in the jury instructions, he said they have to find that the individual died, that this was the cause of the death, and that this assault was committed. And so it was in Hennepin County on the day. And I think the jury maybe came to a decision that all of those elements did exist. For the third degree murder, that means that the action had to be with a depraved mind without regard to human life. And of course, I think the jury might have come to the conclusion that there was a depraved mind here and that there was no consideration for life. And finally, the second degree manslaughter, that's culpable negligence, that it's creating this unreasonable risk. And the judge also gave the elements for that. And there has to be some cause of death as far as the culpable negligence was concerned. The fact that this came back so quickly to me means, Diane, that they probably went through each of those counts and they may actually have come back with a verdict in connection with each of them for guilty. So I was surprised by the swift decision relatively, 10 and a half hours is relatively swift for something this serious, but we might just see something on all three charges. Hmm. We'll find out shortly. Uh, verdict expected some sometime between 4.30 and 5, we hear. Uh, it is the trial of one man, Derek Chauvin, and the whole world watched his actions that are at issue in this case, his knee on the neck of George Floyd for those 9 minutes and 29 seconds. Uh, and while it is not fair for one person to be on the side of a, uh, of a be an iconic image when he's on trial, that is the case. And people all over the world have paid attention to this case, including the President of the United States, President Joe Biden, in an unusual move uh, while the jury was sequestered, but before a verdict had been reached, spoke his own mind about the trial of Derek Chauvin in the death of George Floyd. 
I can only imagine the pressure and anxiety they're feeling. Uh, and so uh, I waited till the jury was sequestered, and, uh, and I called. And as uh, I wasn't going to say anything about it, but uh, Lonius said today on television, and he accurately said it was a private conversation because uh, uh, Joe understands what it's like to go through loss. And um, they're a good family, and they're calling for peace and tranquility, no matter what that verdict is. I'm praying the verdict is the right verdict, which is, I think it's overwhelming in my view. I wouldn't say that unless the, the jury was sequestered now, not hear me say that. All right, President Biden there, he had called the Floyd family, and he's talking about that phone call and his, you know, what he told them. And let me go to uh, Kenneth Moten again. Kenneth, I understand you have some reaction from the Floyd family. Yes, we know that Flonis Floyd spoke with President Biden. Uh, he seemed to be surprised by the call that he got from the president. I uh, said the president just wanted to reach out to him and that he wanted to deliver the words. We've seen this president who suffered a, a grave loss uh, very early in his political career when his wife and his child died in that car crash, who often speaks with people uh, and speaks words of comfort to people who have lost someone. And so Flonis Floyd said, it was words of comfort, and it's essentially, uh, he didn't get into detail about that phone call with the president, uh, but it was one that he said that he appreciated uh, from the president as well. Uh, Flonis Floyd also talked about the demonstrations that have happened in this city, and he said he's asking for peace and calm, Terry and Diane, but he says in the end he can't control what happens on this street. So obviously, if it's a not guilty verdict, this that's what this city is bracing for, because they are expecting violence. Violence. They are expecting um, some kind of type of anarchy and chaos if there's a not guilty verdict because they know that people will be angry. And Flonis Floyd says he knows that, that people would be hurt and angry, but at this point they're optimistic for a guilty verdict. Also, just then, we understand that Derek Chauvin has entered the courtroom, has entered the courthouse, that is, uh, at the Hennepin County Courthouse, just a few blocks away from where I'm standing right now with his attorneys. And so everyone right now is gearing up for this verdict. Obviously, the state prosecutors uh, also in the courthouse, including uh, the attorney general for this state. Terry, Diane. Kenneth, thank you. And I want to go to Leah on this because, Leah, we, we heard what happened in the courtroom yesterday with uh, the judge kind of admonishing Congresswoman Maxine Waters for telling protesters to get more confrontational if there's not a conviction in this case. Today we heard from the president now that the jury was sequestered. Uh, but it just goes to show that while this is the trial of one man, it's hard to ignore the larger impact of this case. So how do those two things intertwine, and could this give the defense a cause for an appeal if there is a conviction here. Well, I think if the you know the defense is going to be looking for anything to use as an appeal, to use as any entryway, because they're looking you know for working on behalf of their client in this case, Derek Chauvin. So that's not surprising that they would grab at everything and anything. But in a trial that has been witnessed by billions of people, one billion people viewed that that uh, George Floyd team in the first week alone. In a trial that has been witnessed around the world by billions and billions of people, it's going to be incredibly hard to make the argument that this is an individualized case that doesn't have broad and sweeping repercussions. Now, I think what's important to recognize here, too, is that people are responding and are reacting to not simply one simple incident, but instead, there has been an enormous amount of symbolism that has been placed on this trial. And it's making, and the trial is, is essentially offering us the decision and offering us an indictment about the American justice system. Does American justice and accountability work on behalf of African Americans, of black people, people who have historically been failed by the justice system in this country? And so we have this case here that's unusual in a number uh, of ways. One, it's unusual in that it's been caught on video for such an extenuating period of time. It's unusual in that charges were brought by the state against the, uh, the accountable police officer, so holding him accountable. And then the third, I think, is in the jury makeup. This is a jury that does look like, in a lot of ways, look like America. It does look incredibly diverse and varied, people from different walks of life, different experiences, different racial and gender backgrounds. So we're seeing an unusual case, but that is being extrapolated out to say something 
about how justice works or does not work in the United States, whether we like it or not. So this is why the decision, so much weight is being placed on the decision today, even though it is just one individual police officer. It says a lot more about America. It says a lot more about our criminal justice system. And it says a lot more about policing and the relationship between justice, order, and equality and equity within the United States. And that, Leah, thank you, is why we're watching, why the world is watching as well. I'd like to bring in uh, Robert Boyce, ABC News contributor, former chief of detectives for the New York City Police Department. And I, I want to ask you about something that the prosecution said, Steve Slesha said in his closing arguments. He told the jurors, this is not an anti-police prosecution. This is a pro-police prosecution. And what, I, what he was trying to communicate, obviously, is, is, is you can support the police and, and find this man guilty. But in, in relation to what Leah was just saying, in a broader sense, is policing in America on trial uh, here as well, do you think? I don't believe so. I think we've, in the last year or so, been through um, so many changes that I think this brings an end to, to some practices that are going on across the country. Uh, uh, neck restraints, it has to end. It ended in New York a long time ago, but nonetheless, it's banned. But nonetheless, it's still happening across the country. So I think that's an end to this. It also brings something else in that we haven't, we haven't trained for that we're seeing now, that an officer with an officer who's involved in something like this needs to step in immediately. So this is this is a seminal moment in law enforcement. We're going to change, uh, and I think we have to through training and so many other methods. I don't think this optic of uh, Derek Chauvin on on George Floyd's neck could ever get past a jury at that point. It's just too strong. So I think it send a, sends a message. It's not aimed at police. It's at this individual's action. That's what I believe. And I believe the prosecutor is correct in that statement. And Leah, we have heard, particularly from the prosecution, but also from analysts, about how the video in this case, in a way, is the star witness of the case. And the prosecution continued to tell the jury, you can believe your eyes, you can believe your heart, you can believe your gut, you're seeing it for yourself. More and more, we see pretty much everybody now has a camera in their pocket at all times. More and more police departments are getting outfitted with body cams. So could this change the way we see Trials in general, but particularly trials having to do with police, could this change the way justice is brought in these cases? Well, yes and no, it can change. And so what we know is that video can play a powerful role. Uh, you know, I, I do like to point to that that tape and that image, right? It's, it's seared into all of our minds of, of Darren Chauvin essentially wiping out the life of George Floyd over a period of nine minutes and 26 seconds, significantly longer than that eight minutes and 46 seconds that we originally thought the tape, the length of the tape was. But that that is a powerful, powerful testament to the way that order and justice and accountability can work within this country. With that, with that being said, we also know that there is a relationship in which video may not be enough. Right? So we have seen cases in the past where there has been video, where there has been kind of this, this uh, visual testimony in which people have not been convicted, in which people have gotten off. And in fact, it has managed to infuriate uh, a larger, uh, uh, larger segment of the population because they are seeing something with their own eyes that doesn't match up with the jury's decision. And so I think we do have to be careful about how we think about this. Videotape is not it's not a savior. It's not a catch-all, right? It does a lot of work and an enormous amount of work and is incredibly important. And certainly it works in favor right, of the victim in this case and in other cases. But we also know that it takes accountability within the justice system itself, right? in order for people to make the right decisions based on that video evidence. I would also say we do know that there, there are problems with people who have body cameras, right, who have body camera evidence and either return, refuse to turn that evidence over to the public and refuse to show that evidence to the public or refuse to turn their body cameras on so that we have that evidence uh, for discussion and for uh, conversa uh, conversation and as part of the evidentiary body. So, you know, we have to think about this far more holistically than we already are. It's not enough simply to have the video evidence. It's also how we interpret it, how we use it, and what kind of access that we get to it as a public, uh, as a public community and as a nation. Hmm. And, and part of the solution there, thanks, Leah, is 
uh, as Bob Boyce was saying, within police departments themselves. And I'd like to bring in another law enforcement voice here. Sonia Pruitt spent decades as a Montgomery County, uh, Maryland police officer, and she is the founder of the Black Police Experience as well, a, an activist group, and has been with us throughout this trial. And Sonia's joining us by phone. And I want to ask you, Sonia, you know, it, it felt a little bit like maybe the thin blue line cracked in this case. The police chief of Minneapolis, uh, Madaria Arredondo, testified against his former officer. Other officers stepped forward to take the witness stand and testified against him as well. They, they had an expert police witness from the Los Angeles Police Department come into court and testify against Derek Chauvin, so, something that hasn't been seen that much. Do you think there is a change happening in, in the culture of policing, in part because of what's happened here? Uh, good afternoon. And, you know, the answer to that question for me is that remains to be seen. I would love to be hopeful because I am an eternal optimist. But the reality is this. We've had moments in our policing history that we thought forced change. Rodney King forced us to look at use of force training. Michael Brown forced us to wear body-worn cameras. George Floyd, here we are again, and we're making a case for consistent use of force training and parameters nationwide. That's what I think will happen after the verdict is read, and hopefully it is conviction on all three counts. But here is the sneaky elephant in that room. That sneaky elephant is systemic racism. We have had multiple reports since January 6th, and even before that, about nationalists joining police force. Forces. The Oath Keepers said that they're getting training from active police officers. When are we as a nation going to have a reckoning about systemic racism in policing and how it is affecting black and brown people and other vulnerable communities? When we do that, then maybe we can make some really, really big forward steps. But until then, we are just going to be spinning our wheels, in my opinion. All right, Sonia Pruitt, thanks for that. And we have some live images, I understand, from outside the courthouse. The city of Minneapolis has been preparing for this moment. Thousands of National Guard troops have been deployed throughout the city. The governor of Minnesota also issued a state of emergency, trying to prepare for the prospect of unrest, depending on how this verdict comes down. And again, that's a live shot of the Hennepin County Courthouse. Uh, and I want to go to Matt Stone, who was actually there in the courtroom yesterday as the attorneys delivered delivered their closing statements. And Matt, we can see the witnesses in this case, and so at some points we could see the judge, we could see the attorneys, we could see Chauvin, uh, but we couldn't see the jury throughout this entire trial. So paint the picture for us a little bit about how the jury was reacting over the course of this more than six hours of closing arguments from both sides. Hey, Diane, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. You had an extremely long closing argument from both the prosecution and from Derek Chauvin's attorney, Eric Nelson. You know, I felt like they were a little bit more engaged during the testimony or during the closing argument uh, from the prosecution, a little bit more fresh. It was earlier on in the day. And of course, we all saw as Eric Nelson continued to go on, the judge interrupted it, him. We kind of hit a, a log in the afternoon where there hadn't been a lunch break. The jury had only been excused for 20 minutes at a certain point. So you could really see on their faces that they were getting uh, a little bit flustered, not just because of the length of the closing argument, but also I believe that a lot of what Eric Nelson was saying. There were especially two women in the front. Based on my view, they were sitting to the left, basically would be right in front of the judge's left, who were shaking their heads a couple of times at the point points that Eric Nelson was making. So I do believe, obviously, with the verdict now in, uh, you know, that could be a clue to, to where this ends up. But of course, you know, with the pandemic, they're wearing masks. So it is difficult to see, you know, are they smiling? I'm just reading their eyebrows, their facial expressions. It's very difficult to kind of see exactly what they're saying. Obviously, 14 jurors in the room, 12 were excused. It's a very diverse group. Uh, but for the most part, they, they were engaged. And I think, as I mentioned yesterday, regardless of what the decision is that we'll, we'll hear in a couple of hours, uh, I, I do believe that they left, you know, they went through everything, all the elements, all the exhibits. And, you know, I believe this is a jury that uh, did a pretty good job 
in terms of coming to a decision. And of course, we'll, we'll see what that is shortly. Yeah, and Matt, you mentioned how the jury is wearing masks, as were most of the people in the courtroom. So it can be hard sometimes to read their facial expressions. But we were showing video uh, just a few seconds ago of Derek Chauvin, who was also wearing a mask throughout the course of this entire trial until his attorney started delivering closing arguments. And then for the first time throughout the course of this trial, we saw Derek Chauvin remove his mask. What was that moment like in the courtroom? It's funny. I was I was on with David and actually was running back in as he was taking off the mask. And, and you know, I think the jury understood what the moment meant uh, from the defense's side. They were obviously trying to humanize Derek Chauvin. You know, obviously, just they did not really know that much about him coming in. Clearly, that's why they were picked to be on a fair and impartial jury. But they they kind of all stared at him, and there was a lot of jurors who their eyes were focused on him. Uh, throughout a lot of Eric Nelson's testimony, they or excuse me, closing argument, they were locked in on Chauvin to see if he had any reaction. He's a very stoic man. Any time there had been any video exhibits played by the prosecution, you know, he would not look. He would look down at his notes. He had a notepad that he was taking notes throughout the entire trial. We, we saw it each day. But when his attorney, Eric Nelson, showed video or showed any sort of images on the screen, he was looking and he was taking in that information. Hmm. Th thank you, Matt, for that um, eyewitness account. These jurors have that fate of the one man, uh, the defendant in that courtroom, and his, his attorney obviously trying to make some connection there between this individual, Derek Chauvin, and the people who hold his fate in their hands and have reached a decision on that. Let me go back to Kenneth Moten in Minneapolis. The jury here, you know, there was a feeling that it was more or less representative of Hennepin County, that jury pool predominantly white, as is the jury. What's the, what's the general feeling there about the jury, do you think? The general feeling is that this jury had a lot of work to do uh, and a lot of eyes, a lot of pressure was on this jury as well. And so you mentioned kind of this jury and the makeup of this jury and we know that um, it started out with 15, there were two alternates, two of them were dismissed as soon as the deliberations started and so we know that it's majority white but there are also uh, four people who identify as black, uh, six people of color. So when it comes to this jury, everyone is wondering, obviously, what were those deliberations like? What was happening inside that room? Uh, again, 10 and a half hours or so, when it comes to the amount of time they were deliberating, um, they had to go through jury instructions. They had to go through, essentially, worksheets of each of those charges, second degree unintentional, third degree murder, second degree manslaughter as well, and go through those, go through the evidence. They had mountains of evidence when it comes to video, uh, video uh, surveillance video, police body camera video, uh, that cell phone video, that nine minutes, 29 seconds that everyone, the world really has seen as well. And Terry and Diane, I really want to, you guys have asked me over the course of this trial as well, what are the people on the streets? What are they seeing? What are the people of Minneapolis seeing in this area? And yes, the people on the streets are obviously they're demanding justice, they're angry, they're upset, like most people who saw that video. But I also spoke with essentially anyone I could talk with here in Minneapolis, the people at the restaurants, uh, the waiters, you know, the, uh, the, pe the host also that was seating me. I wanted to know what they were thinking. And actually, even on uh, the flight here over the weekend, I talked to a woman who's sitting right next to me. She's from Minneapolis. Um, she's a middle-aged woman, white woman uh, in her 50s. She showed me images on her phone of the community. She works at a nearby hospital near 38th in Chicago. She was saddened to see businesses boarded up, burned out businesses from the riots that happened last summer after the May 25th incident. She calls Chauvin a knucklehead who just needs to accept the consequences of his actions she believes that he won't get second degree, that he won't be found guilty of second degree murder. She believes that no matter what happens, that people won't be satisfied uh, with this verdict as well. She worries about her community and feels it's going downhill, wants business owners to be able to open their stores again. So that gives you a little flavor, a little touch of what, what people here in Minneapolis is feeling. Um, even after that verdict happens, they're still worried about their community.
And I want to go back, kind of thank you. I want to go back to uh, former NYPD chief of detectives, Robert Boyce, for a little more on, on how the law enforcement community is viewing all of this. Because, Robert, we heard the prosecutors say that there's nothing worse for good police than bad police, and how the police are not on trial here. Derek Chauvin is on trial. But we've also heard over the years a lot about the thin blue line and a lot about how law enforcement, the community of law enforcement officers, tends to stick together. So, overall, how is the law enforcement community viewing and reacting to this case? Guyane, I think from what, when this initial happened about a year ago, we took a look at this and I asked everybody in law enforcement that I knew, and everyone to a person, to an individual person, was repulsed by that video. Everyone. And it hurts law enforcement. It hurts our ability to, to deal with the public. It gives us a bad image. Um, just, just this past week, officers were assaulted with uh, Molotov cocktails in New York. So it sends a message that, you know, that now we're, we have to watch out for ourselves because there's going to be people in the, uh, on the fringes of society who are going to try to hurt us when they see this message. So we are concerned. I don't know anybody who, who supported um, that, that video when they saw it. That was a long trial. And I hope this is a reckoning that this is over, that uh, we're going to move forward and we'll get back to, uh, to, to proper, well-trained law enforcement, intelligently um, executed in the street. So hopefully this, this is an end of things that we can go forward. I am concerned about tonight, no matter what happens with the verdict or where it goes, and we think we know where it's going now, but I'm still concerned about what might happen later on in my city and cities across the nation. For all those officers on the street trying to trying to do it right. Let, let me go to Leah Wright Rigur on, on this question. Uh, Leah, uh, there is a lot of talk about reimagining police in America, reconstructing how we approach the issue of public safety. For a time, for a long time, perhaps, it, it, it did feel to a lot of people as if there was a militarization of our police. And uh, having lived overseas, there's no question we have a, uh, a very different kind of policing in America, perhaps because we need it, we are a more violent society, uh, than they do in other places. But uh, do you think that is actually happening, reimagining policing in America? What might it look like? Sure. So I think one thing to keep in mind is that the United States is really unique in, the, in a lot of regards in that we incarcerate more people, right, uh, per, per, I think, per capita than any other nation in the world, particularly amongst developed nations in the world. We also have a very different kind of policing and police force that is far more violent, I think, than any other nation in, a, in the developed world. So we're unique in that respect. What I do think that we are beginning to see, and this actually ex exists irrespective of the outcome of today's, uh, of today's trial, of the Chauvin trial, is that people are beginning to say, I can reimagine or I can imagine a world where policing is not right, at the center of how we engage communities. It's not at the center of, you know, or a carceral state is not at the center of how things work within this country. That if we have a social problem, the people that we call shouldn't be necessarily be the police because the police aren't, uh, aren't trained in handling these kinds of things. And I think it's not simply the George Floyd moment that drove us there, but instead in the ensuing months, that came that were subsequent to the Derek Flo uh, to the George Floyd moment uh, proved that the United States and policing had a significant problem that couldn't be solved even after a man was killed on uh, on television. So I think part of what we're beginning to see is that in a nation that still continues to con to kill black people, we have to find imaginative and creative ways to really solve this problem. All right, Leah Wright Rigor, thanks for that. Again, the jury in the trial against Derek Chauvin has now reached a verdict. After 10 and a half hours of deliberating, they will determine whether Derek Chauvin will be convicted of killing George Floyd. We're awaiting that verdict now at any minute. Here's David Muir. This is an ABC News special report. The death of George Floyd. Derek Chauvin on trial. Now reporting, David Mueller. Good afternoon. We're coming on the air at this hour because a verdict has been reached in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Closing arguments, of course, just 24 hours ago from both sides. The jury then given instructions late yesterday. They began deliberating. And again this morning, continuing with those deliberations. And now their decision expected at any moment in Minneapolis. 
Of course, we know that Chauvin is charged with the death of George Floyd, the country watching, the world watching those images. Chauvin with his knee to George Floyd's neck. It prompted an almost immediate reckoning in this country on race, justice, and policing in America. The prosecution focused on those nine minutes, 29 seconds, and in their closing argument, reminding the jury of the nine-year-old girl, one of the witnesses, the bystanders, who said she heard paramedics nine minutes later saying, get off of him. They said, believe what you see. The defense saying it was about more than those nine minutes, trying to sow doubt in the jury's minds. The jury deliberating for 10 and a half hours, four hours last night, six and a half hours today. Chauvin facing charges of second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. We heard his voice in that courtroom when he invoked his Fifth Amendment right last week not to take the stand in his own defense. Today, we learned President Biden called George Floyd's family yesterday. The president suggesting today that the evidence is, quote, overwhelming and saying, quote, I'm praying that the verdict is the right verdict. And the president adding he was only sharing those words because he knew the jury was sequestered and had begun their work. About 2,000 National Guard members on duty in Minneapolis, police in cities across the country on alert as well. And our entire team is standing by with us this afternoon as we await the verdict in the trial of that former Minneapolis police officer. I want to bring in our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams, to start our coverage here. And Dan, conventional wisdom, you know, they say it's made to throw it out. But in this case, there were no questions from the jury, no confusion over the charges, uh, no notes sent to the judge, a relatively short amount of time to deliberate. Yeah, you have to be very nervous if you're Derek Chauvin right now. First of all, because a hung jury is off the table. We now know that this jury is unanimous. And the fact that they didn't ask questions uh, would again suggest that it's more likely, if you were sort of following the way these things go, that it's going to be the higher, the highest charge in this case. Why? Because if it was going to be a manslaughter, let's say, for example, you would expect that there might have been more debate about the definitions and, and, and uh, discussions about third degree murder versus manslaughter, et cetera. For a high profile case, this is a pretty fast verdict. Some people will tell you, wait a sec, 10 hours plus, that's not so fast. That's true, but in high profile cases, when the world is watching, the jurors typically want to uh, cross the T's and dot the I's and make it clear to the world that they very carefully considered the evidence. So the fact that they have already come back here with so little coming from the jury has got to be uh, very frightening news for Derek Chauvin right now. All right, Dan Abrams with us as we await this verdict. Dan, stick with us here. I want to bring Sonny Hostin into this conversation, a former prosecutor herself, ABC News legal analyst, of course, co-host of The View. And Dan makes a good point there, Sonny, about uh, these jurors obviously knowing the weight of this case and, and that the nation is watching them. And I just want to remind our viewers at home what Judge Cahill said when he was delivering instructions to the jurors. He said, do not let bias, prejudice, passion, sympathy, or public opinion influence your decision and warning them not to consider what consequences their verdict might have. And the fact that they've deliberated for such a short window, what does that signal to you? Well, uh, conventional wisdom does tell you that fast verdicts hint at agreement. And I will tell you that in all of the cases uh, that I tried, and there were many, especially uh, in the criminal context, what you want as a prosecutor is a fast verdict. Because when there are no questions, when there are no clarifications asked by a jury for uh, jury instructions, when you have nothing to read from from the jury, a fast verdict like this indicates that there is a full agreement. I am very surprised, actually, that they reached an agreement in such a high-profile case with 45 witnesses uh, in, in just a little over 10 hours. That is very unusual um, in, in, in a case like this with 12 jurors. Sometimes in a civil case, yes, um, you get fast verdicts, but in this kind of case, it is very unusual. Usual. I actually was expecting uh, many questions. I was expecting some questions about legal clarification, jury instructions, uh, clarifications. And I was actually, David, also expecting what we call the Allen charge, which is, okay, I understand that you are stuck. I understand that there's disagreement, but I want you to go back and do your best and come to an agreement. I was fully expecting something like that. Uh, and obviously, that did not happen. The jury has reached uh, an agreement. 
that's unusual. Sonny Hostin with us this afternoon, Sonny, underscoring that point that there was not one question from the jury, not one point of contention or query to the judge about confusion over any of the charges, which, as Sonny suggests, points to agreement within uh, the jury, obviously, given the short amount of time that they were deliberating. Uh, you're looking at a live picture of Minneapolis. We should mention that those images from inside the courtroom, that was during the course of the trial and the closing arguments. Uh, there is no live stream yet up and running from that courtroom. And we should also remind all of you at home that the reason there's a live stream in this case is because we find ourselves not only in this moment, this conversation, this racial reckoning in this country, but also in the middle of a pandemic. The judge deciding to make that rare choice to live stream this trial because he knew that members of the community and members of George Floyd's family would not allow to be in that courtroom given the restrictions on the number of people they're actually allowing inside that court. But in turn, in deciding to live stream the trial, that means the country can watch, the world can watch, and they are waiting for this verdict as well. I want to bring in ABC's Alex Perez, who's been on the ground in Minneapolis since this case began. And Alex, what's the temperature there in Minneapolis? I know it, it seems relatively calm, although uh, the National Guard on scene, and they are preparing for this verdict as well. Well, David, uh, they've been preparing for weeks now for this verdict. Yes, there's those 2,000 members of the National Guard sort of scattered all around town. If you look uh, around the downtown area here, most of the businesses are boarded up. Uh, people just did not want to take any chances. We remember those protests, those violent protests that happened here last summer, and people were afraid that they want to be ready for any sort of verdict to come. Now, David, we also uh, want to talk about the jury. You know, we've been focusing on every single thing that they've done. And this is a group of jurors that has been taking notes uh, every day during uh, this trial. It was noted that they were attentive, that they were uh, seemed inquisitive and paying attention to the experts who testified. And, you know, it's really hard to read the tea leaves in a situation like this. But one of the things that I noted yesterday, just in covering trials, yesterday the jury started deliberating uh, very late and they stayed an extra hour. Even after a long day, they stayed an extra hour. And this morning they started deliberating about 90 minutes early and to me that seemed to indicate that perhaps they were close to reaching something and wanted to work on it and now we know they have reached some sort of uh, a decision and we're going to learn that decision very soon and as, as we await that decision David I think about my conversation with Terrence Floyd George Floyd's brother and I remember he was in so much pain right after this incident happened and one of the things he said to me was that uh, seeing this case through all the way through a conviction was something that his family wanted for and will continue to fight for until they saw it. So they could have an answer to that very soon, David. Alex Perez in Minneapolis. Alex, thank you. That was a live picture there of Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, uh, not far from the scene of where this all began to unfold. About a year ago, Memorial Day last year, of course, the corner of Chicago and 38th Street there in front of the Cup Foods in South Minneapolis, George Floyd Square, as it's now called. I want to bring in Lindsay Davis because, Lindsay, you and I have talked so much about this case. We've been on the air together all along the way, and it's so rare that this country uh, takes a sort of deep breath together to watch one of these moments come in. But this is one of those moments, given the, the, the reckoning, the conversation in this country. And I think that we were all struck a year ago and then the continuing protests and conversations over the course of the year, the diversity in the faces of the people out in the streets, small towns, large cities, uh, somewhat reassuring, I know, to the Floyd family as well, to see the diversity of the people supporting them and this conversation about uh, policing injustice in America. That's right. So many collectively holding their breath here, David. You can perhaps hear the helicopters above. I know that uh, we just saw the crowds outside of Cup Foods at 38th in Chicago, but just to kind of scene set for you here, just a few blocks away from the courthouse in downtown Minneapolis, it's eerily quiet. You know, there are a few cars, but very few people out on the road. I went uh, for a walk today just to kind of get a temperature and feel of, of the people. Happened to just come in contact with one man. He happened to be a black man. I said, so what we think and he said I think if they come back quick we got him and he had a personal pride he was invested some skin in the game he kind of uh, felt that, that he was taking this on certainly uh, personally uh, with regard to whatever the verdict would be 
And I was thinking about the jurors as well. I mean, there's people from all walks of life. Uh, you have three who are in their 20s, ranging in age. You have one woman who goes in, into her 60s, um, and six who identify as people of color, three of them uh, black men. You have uh, one who's a, a social worker, accountant, a chemist, a banker, a nurse. Um, and we did get a, a lot of color during the jury selection about uh, their thoughts on, on race and social justice and, and criminal justice. There was uh, a white man who was very clear. He said, look, I believe all lives matter. You had a black man who said uh, that when he had seen the video, he had told his wife that could have been me. And, and so going into this, they, they allowed uh, these jurors that had these diverse opinions and backgrounds and experiences and perspectives. And then you had just uh, a few days before the jury, the, before the trial culminated, uh, the, the shooting, the fatal shooting of, of Dante Wright, which uh, the defense obviously wanted them to be sequestered and not, not hear that, but the judge uh, allowed them to hear that. And so you have to wonder, were they at all impacted by that? And were they able to just focus on this as an isolated incident, or did they look at the historical injustice of all this? Additionally, they knew about the $27 million settlement. This was the largest pretrial settlement uh, in America's history um, for this kind of uh, a civil rights death. And so a lot going into what those jurors brought into this and, and what they thought as it all played out in real time. We can hear the choppers overhead there in Minneapolis. Our thanks to Lindsay Davis, and we'll be checking back in with you over the course of this afternoon. These are live pictures on the ground there in South Minneapolis. Uh, relative calm, as you can see in this community, and in so many communities across this country, I think people in uh, their smartphones have heard that there is a verdict, the judge revealing that uh, and saying that the verdict would be delivered in about an hour. That was a little more than an hour ago, so we are expecting that jury at any time. And Lindsay talking about the diversity of the members of that jury, and I know we have that graphic that actually breaks down members of the jury, if we have a moment to bring that back up, just to help folks at home understand that the jury selection was something that both sides so carefully spent time on in this case. Members of the jury, uh, five men, seven women, ages from 20 to 60 years old, uh, four black jurors, six white jurors, and two jurors who self-identify as multiracial. Uh, one of the jurors, for example, a white woman in her 50s, she works as a nurse, uh, she assured the court that even though she had seen a portion of that viral video, that the video of George Floyd on the ground, that she could be impartial. And she acknowledged that we all bring life experience uh, to the jury if we are selected and talked about how she her background as a nurse could potentially help her make decisions uh, in this case. I want to bring in Nightline anchor Byron Pitts, who's been covering this uh, right along with us from the very beginning. And Byron, I mentioned this a moment ago in talking with Lindsay, the diversity of the faces of the families across this country who, who wanted justice after seeing that video themselves. And this has really been almost a year-long conversation in this country about how we move forward. You're so right, David, and that's what, why this moment is so different from other moments in American history, where we've seen instances where, where black America went one direction and white America seemed to go someplace else. In this particular moment, this case, the reaction seemed to be universal. The people of all stripes reacted in a very passionate way to the death of George Floyd. And David, I'm struck by something that you said earlier that this is a deep breath moment for our nation. I think you're absolutely right. You, you think about these kinds of trials. I was looking at the, that trial, the four police officers in Los Angeles in 1992, the O.J. Simpson trial in 1995. This day is one of those moments where many Americans will hold their breath to see what happens. And, and David, I think in many ways, we may have two verdicts today. We will have the verdict of this jury, this diverse jury, and in the hours and days to come, we will have the verdict of the American people. One can imagine that, however it goes, a portion of America will see that justice will serve. A portion of America will say that justice missed its mark. And I think while we wait for this verdict, it'll also be curious to see, and I think that's why we see the law enforcement presence uh, in Minneapolis and other major cities across this nation, as we all, David, as you said, hold our breath waiting for this verdict. And of course, Byron, no one wants to get ahead of themselves as far as this verdict is concerned. We do know that the relatively short amount of time and the weight of this case, uh, as we heard from Sonny Hostin earlier, uh, signals that there was agreement and fairly early on uh, within that jury. 
uh, that jury that was sequestered immediately after those closing arguments, immediately after getting instructions from the judge who asked them not to bring their bias into that uh, decision making, but also not to worry or be concerned with how the country and the world would react to their decision. Because after all, the live stream showed the rest of us uh, what transpired in that courtroom, with the exception of the jurors themselves. We all got to watch, but we didn't see the, the folks who will actually make this decision who were there from day one during this trial. I want to bring in Terry Austin uh, from Law and Crime, the network that covers this. She's been covering this case, obviously, for the better part of a year. And Terry, I wanted to remind people at home, as we await this decision from the jury, what the prosecution was up against here. They had to convince beyond, a, beyond reasonable doubt that Derek Chauvin's actions, his knee to the neck, was a substantial cause of George Floyd's death. Not the only cause, but a substantial one. That's exactly right. And I think the jury did boil it down to two issues. That issue that you just mentioned, the fact that there was unreasonable use of force and that the substantial cause of the death was that unreasonable use of force. So they narrowed it down and I think they came to a quick decision based on all of the evidence. And we had multiple witnesses who talked about this use of force. And of course, we had Chief Arredondo, who was pivotal in stating not only was this unreasonable use of force, but this was against policy and it was not showing the duty of care. The other issue that clearly the jury came to a very swift conclusion was the fact that the cause of death was the knee and it was unreasonable. And so they listened to all the medical evidence. They listened to all of the evidence from the police officers. They cut to the chase. I'm sure they did consider the different elements that the judge talked about as far as the second degree, third degree, and manslaughter. But I think they narrowed it down to what Jerry Blackwell said on his rebuttal, which was this. Use the 46 witness on the stand, which is your common sense. If you believe that, in fact, what you saw on this video was unreasonable force and that the knee on the back and the neck caused the death, then you have to come back with the guilty verdict. And I do believe that's exactly what they did. Well, we'll wait and see for that because we also know that the defense spent three hours yesterday in its closing argument from defense attorney Eric Nelson to try to sow doubt among that jury, continuing uh, with what he had done over the course of the trial, bringing up uh, past drug use uh, of, of George Floyd, his heart condition, asking was there the potential of any carbon monoxide from that patrol car? Did bystanders distract uh, Derek Chauvin uh, while he was uh, right there at that scene with his knee to George Floyd's neck for nine minutes, 29 seconds? And the defense attorney tried to make the case that this this particular trial is about more than those nine minutes that the jurors, when they deliberate, should be thinking about, uh, as he said, the 16 minutes that came before and what Chauvin came upon when he arrived at that scene. He, he tried to use images of them putting George Floyd into the patrol car, three officers trying to do that uh, to no avail, to try to make the case that those were all factors that Derek Chauvin took into account in those nine minutes. Of course, then the rebuttal from the prosecution, uh, making the point that over the course of those nine minutes, he certainly had time to react uh, to what he was presiding over during those nine minutes. Uh, and, and a direct reaction to the carbon monoxide suggestion, saying if that were in fact the case, the, the carbon monoxide was coming from the police patrol car. So he should have been aware of that too. So we, we saw a back and forth between the prosecution and the defense as they made their closing arguments yesterday. I want to bring in Kenneth Moten from Minneapolis. Kenneth was on the air with us yesterday as we were covering these closing arguments. I know that you have been in touch with George Floyd's family uh, and his uh, family's representation. Uh, ben Crump and others uh, for their reaction to the prosecution's closing argument and then the defense once we heard the three hours of their closing argument. And I'm curious if you're hearing anything in the last 24 hours and to the development uh, of this last hour. David, they are gather, gathered in a hotel here in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, the words we're hearing right now at this hour, 
they're optimistic, they are in good spirits, but they're also anxious, eager, nervous as we await this verdict here. Also, we know that when it comes to this Floyd family, that in the past 10, 11 months or so since the death of George Floyd, this family has gone through a lot. Yes, they got a $27 million settlement, but they lost this loved one, this person they knew who they watched in this video die uh, at the knee of Derek Chauvin. And so for this family, they've gotten the good and the bad, David. They have gotten a lot of support, but they've also heard from the critics who believe that George Floyd uh, shouldn't have resisted, uh, that he was on drugs, that he was somehow at fault. But they've got a number of supporters, people who have been in these streets. And so Flonis Floyd, the brother of George Floyd, has said that he is urging for peace and calm uh, after this verdict is read, but he knows that he can't control the anger on these streets for those people who are hitting the streets. And really, David, for this family, for months now, they have watched this country go through a racial reckoning. They've watched this country change, um, and many industries change because of this racial reckoning. But they truly feel that today, with this verdict, that today is their day of reckoning. David. Kenneth Moten in Minneapolis uh, and the family all along has asked for peace and calm across this country, something Terrence Floyd uh, told me almost a year ago in Brooklyn, that they were uh, deeply moved by the diversity of the faces in these protests across the country, but saying uh, any sort of violence is not what their brother uh, would have wanted. I want to bring in our senior national correspondent, Steve Osinsami, uh, of course, following the case as well. And Steve, as you and I were on the air yesterday during these closing arguments, we heard the prosecution say this is not an anti-police prosecution, that this is the case of Derek Chauvin, one uh, lone officer in this particular trial. We know other officers will come later, perhaps, uh, later this summer, but this case is about Derek Chauvin, they said. And what was fascinating in this trial, and, and somewhat rare as you know, Steve, is that sort of blue wall uh, came down. There were a number of police witnesses that they used to make this case, and they put up a graphic during their closing argument, the prosecution just showing uh, just the significance of the number of police witnesses who came forward and said this action was not justified. That's right, David. And chief among them was this officer's former boss. You had a prosecutor saying that this wasn't policing, this was murder, that this was a shocking abuse of authority, that you cannot justify what everyone saw in that videotape. And I, and I want to share just a little bit of inside baseball. You know, Byron alluded to the Rodney King incident. You know, there are a lot of people saying that the only difference between what happened in the Rodney King incident where those officers walked away and what is happening here is the improved quality of the videotape. You know, this, this verdict could prove that line wrong or it could underline it. So a lot of people, especially in black America, are waiting to see, will this happen again? Will what we see with our own eyes be rejected by a jury? And I'll tell you, some of the arguments that we were hearing from the defense in this case, that, that this was a, I, I call it the super black of defense, you know, a, a big black man who was super strong and uh, had some chemicals that were assisting him in his strength. You know, we've, we've heard many of those arguments before in some of these other cases. The Walter Scott case in South Carolina, people forget that was another case where you saw a police officer shoot a black man in the back. It was on camera. and. That officer was not acquitted in state court. And in fact, when we polled the jury, jury, you know, we expected there was probably one holdout. And that's what the defense in this case is hoping for, just one. But in that case, there were two. And one of the holdouts was African-American. So you just never know what you're going to get from these cases, what the jury is hearing, how they process the information. And, you know, one thing I want to underline that, that, the, that, the, that the prosecution, as you pointed out, was very big about was they wanted to make sure that this wasn't an anti-police case. They wanted to underline to any jurors out there that this isn't about punishing cops. This is about punishing a bad cop. And that was the message that, that they were really trying to underline and that we'll see if it has gotten across to the jurors in this case. It's so important to point out, Steve, that we simply do not know what this jury has decided. All we do know is that they have come to a verdict in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, as Steve mentioned there, the defense, what they try to do is, of course, sow some doubt uh, in the mind of at least one juror uh, to hold up the verdict, to get them to deliberate even longer, to, to, to get one of the jurors to make make other jurors question in that deliberation room, but that does not appear to be the case. 
obviously, in this trial to reach a, a verdict of guilty or not guilty. All 12 jurors need to agree on a charge, and that is what we have here. We simply don't know uh, what their decision is in this case. And I want to bring in Terry Moran because, Terry, we were, we were talking there with Byron and with Steve and, and Lindsay a little earlier about the diversity of faces, the, the wide swath of Americans. It sort of was a, uh, the fabric of America that we watched over the course of the last year. Uh, people who looked at that video and then had to have that conversation with their children at home, uh, children. And we saw the nine-year-old witness in this case who said she heard paramedics say, get off of him. Uh, children often know when they look at an image, at least, uh, what, they, what they believe is right or wrong. They do, David, and, and Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell used the testimony of, of that nine-year-old girl, a, a minor witness not identified by name in this trial, to make the case to the jury she got it right. And it's the feeling that we all had when, when my own uh, then seven-year-old daughter asked uh, my wife uh, what had happened. She'd heard something about it, and my wife had explained it to her. She burst into tears. And that's the wisdom of a seven-year-old, too. And I think one of the things, having covered trials where police officers are on trial in the past, our country has, a, as we know, a, a bad history in many ways with these. Something felt different to me in this one. Uh, the, the first eyewitnesses, the bystander eyewitnesses, that nine-year-old girl, her cousin Darnella Frazier, who took uh, the videotape, uh, Charles uh, McMillan, who was the elder, the mayor of that community, who took the witness stand and burst into tears. The whole world saw that video. They saw the event. And they brought us even closer to that experience of horror that we all had in watching that. The other thing that felt different, the thin blue line shattered in this case. The chief of police, Madaria Arredondo of, of Minneapolis, took the stand against his former officer. So did other officers in that, in that department, took the witness stand and testified against, for the prosecution, against Derek Chauvin, a police officer, an expert witness from the Los Angeles Police Department, came across the country. Lawyers I talked to said they'd never seen anything like it. So there was the, something different in this trial. The reckoning of the uprising uh, that uh, it happened in our streets, I think, was felt in that courtroom, and not in an illegitimate way, in a true way. Terry, stick with us here as we look at live pictures from Minneapolis, uh, the people at that community, and really across this country now. Uh, so many have had the chance to, to be alerted through social media or on their phone that the verdict has been reached. One of those very rare moments in this country, as I mentioned earlier, when people will come uh, to the TV or wherever they can get their information to find out what the decision will be uh, from these jurors. But Terry, you bring up a good point. There, there was something about this trial, a number of things that were different from what we've seen in the past. But one of the things that was uh, I took note of was the fact that both sides tried to make bias an issue. We heard from the prosecution about uh, the bias that we're, that we're all raised to believe that police officers, and the vast majority of them do, try to protect and serve their community, but that we should not think about police as a whole, but about this, this specific officer. That was what the prosecution said to the jurors as they uh, were prepared to go in and then deliberate his fate. On the flip side of that, we heard the closing argument yesterday that uh, the defense attorney for Derek Chauvin saying, you know, don't be biased with everything that they have presented in this case. You must keep in mind what Derek Chauvin uh, saw and heard when the dispatch call first came in, what he saw when he arrived on the scene in those 16 minutes before. Uh, those crucial nine minutes that the, the country and the world saw, but, but he tried to make the case you must think about uh, the information that he gathered in his head uh, in the 16 minutes prior. And he tried to introduce the bystanders, the witnesses, uh, as a form of distraction. Uh, and at some points, he tried to make the case that there, there was a potential danger from people there in the community. Uh, those two very different um, arguments over bias, and I'm curious uh, if it struck you and which argument uh, carried greater weight. It, it did, and I think you're exactly right uh, on what the defense was trying to do there by, uh, in South Chicago, 38th and Minneapolis, of, uh, 38th and Chicago and Minneapolis, a very diverse neighborhood, trying to communicate to the jurors, well, Derek Chauvin had a legitimate concern because, you know, there were people from that neighborhood on the street. But the problem was we heard from them, the jurors heard from them, and they saw the picture of them, and they heard what they were trying to do. They were trying to stop what they thought was an atrocity. And, and I think one of the things 
that the defense had such a hard problem with is that I think every decent American, every patriotic American recognizes that we have had a problem in this country. We've had a problem with the use of force against black bodies and black people. And, and that's not to say that a person like Derek Chauvin can't get a, a fair trial. It is to understand uh, that the history here, uh, you know, has resulted in bad verdicts. And the jury has that history in their hearts as we all do. And, and that, I think, is how they're going to address those claims of bias on both sides. Their job is to look at the evidence against this man and the law in this case. But they speak for the community, for their local community, and for all of us. Terry Moran with us from our Washington Bureau. Terry, thank you. As we continue to look at pictures, these are the aerial uh, pictures, of course, from uh, Minneapolis coming in. There's also pictures uh, from South Minneapolis right in front of the Cup Foods, uh, the scene of, 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 of horror really witnessed by the entire world because of the video that was captured uh, that day. Uh, and you can see the, the vigil there for George Floyd, the images uh, of George Floyd and people gathering. Um, very calm scenes across this country, as we have mentioned here. No one wants to get ahead of themselves. We have no idea uh, what the jury has decided. All we know at this point, for those of you just joining us for our live coverage, 5 p.m. Eastern, is that the judge in this case, Judge Cahill in Minneapolis, has revealed that the jurors have reached a verdict in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who has been charged with uh, three charges, as we know, in the death of George Floyd. Uh, we will learn from the jury momentarily. He said in about an hour. Uh, that would have been about 30 minutes ago, but we do know that they were sequestered in a hotel in Minneapolis. You have to factor in the idea that they would be brought. Uh, and there's high security in this case to the Hennepin County uh, courtroom, uh, several floors up in that office building in downtown Minneapolis, where we have seen the fencing and the uh, significant presence of the National Guard, though uh, luckily, and uh, we have not seen any reason uh, for that security up until this point. And of course, uh, everyone waiting to hear what the jury has decided uh, in this case. I want to bring in Deborah Roberts. Uh, ABC's Deborah Roberts, uh, um, a mom uh, first and foremost, and, and a veteran correspondent here. But Deborah, you were uh, telling us that um, it's a conversation that you had in your family with your children just in the last 24 hours about how the country, how the world might react to this. That's right, David. And I'd have to tell you, when you all alluded to the videotape, uh, as Steve Osinsami talked about, that was so much clearer and so much more impactful this time. Uh, yesterday, watching those closing arguments and seeing so much of that excruciating videotape just sort of, I think, took us all back to last summer when this case just, I think, just struck everybody. And if you have blood running through your veins, there's just no way you weren't impacted by that videotape. And just hearing those cries of George Floyd Floyd calling for his mother. I mean, there was something that was so primal and so difficult about that. And I did interviews last year with moms talking about how that affected them. And of course, of so many of us having conversations, as Terry said, with our children. And I had a conversation with my own 18-year-old son about it. And I have to tell you, it was emotional for me hearing him talk about how fearful he was after seeing something like that. And even right now, he can't even look at it. He turns away from this tape, seeing this man's final minutes on this earth. So so I think there's something about that tape that just struck at everyone. And I think while we all know that, you know, you can't predict a jury and there are going to be people, as Terry said, who may feel like the jury got it wrong, there just seems to be sort of this united feeling in this country that there was something so terribly wrong that went on last year. And I think that people are just waiting. I mean, someone just posted on social media, I'm sick to my stomach waiting for this verdict. I think for so many people, this is the culmination of just an awful Awful, awful event that we have had to witness as people with our children as parents and it has been something that has been very very difficult and I think that the weight of this verdict is sort of in play right here for so many of us who are dealing with with this as parents as well as just people who are watching what's going to happen so you can't I think overstate uh, the anxiety and the nervousness that people are feeling as they're waiting to see this come to a conclusion and Deborah we of course have to remember that there is another family watching all of this all over again and and that's the family of George Floyd. And Deborah, I'm curious, 
you know, a year later with the context of all of the reporting now, you know, that nine minute video uh, spoke volumes mm. just by what we saw in the video, but given the context of the reporting and then what we've watched because there was a live stream of the trial. So uh, the country, the world watching, uh, both sides make their cases and with that additional uh, context and with the very emotional testimony of those bystanders. I mean, we met just about everybody standing on that sidewalk just by watching this trial and you have to wonder and we'll learn uh, which way the jury decides uh, here in, in just a, a short time from now. But you have to wonder um, the impact of playing that video in the courtroom, not, not just for the family of George Floyd, it must have been excruciating to go through this all over again, but, but in those closing arguments, the decision by the prosecution, they went much shorter with the video than they did in the opening statement. Mm -hmm. uh, on the flip side, the defense used um, quite a bit of the video with George Floyd on the ground, and I'll be curious Thank to see you. what jurors mm -hmm. decide. Uh, from watching that video. In many ways, it was more difficult the second time around. And Judge Cahill now in the courtroom. Deborah, stand by. Our entire team standing by. for the jury. All right, please be seated. Members of the jury, I understand you have a verdict. Members of the jury, I will now read the verdicts as they will appear in the permanent records of the 4th Judicial District. State of Minnesota, County of Hennepin, District Court, 4th Judicial District. State of Minnesota Plaintiff versus Derek Michael Chauvin, Defendant. Verdict, Count 1, Court File Number 27, CR 20-12646. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to Count 1, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021 at 1.44 p.m. Signed juror four person, juror number 19. Same caption, verdict count two. We the jury in the above entitled matter as to count two, third degree murder perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021 at 1.45 p.m. Signed by jury four person, juror number 19. Same caption, verdict count three. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count three, second degree manslaughter, culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021, at 1.45 p.m. Jury four person 019. Members of the jury, I'm now going to ask you individually if these are your true and correct verdicts. Please respond yes or no. Juror number two, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number nine, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 19, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 27, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 44, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 52, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 55, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 79, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 85, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 89, is this your, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 91, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 92, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Are these your verdicts, so say you one, so say you all? Yes. 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 Members of the jury, I find that uh, the verdicts as read reflect the will of the jury and will be filed accordingly.
I have to thank you on behalf of the people of the state of Minnesota for not only jury service, but heavy duty jury service. What I'm going to ask you to do now is to follow the deputy back into your usual room and I will join you in a few minutes to answer questions and to advise you further. So all rise for the jury. seated. With the guilty verdicts returned, we're going to have uh, Blakely, you may file a uh, written argument as to Blakely factors within one week. The court will issue findings on the Blakely factors, the factual findings. One week after that, we'll order a PSI immediately returnable in four weeks. And we will also have a briefing on after you get the PSI, six weeks from now and then eight weeks from now we will have sentencing we'll get you the exact dates uh in a scheduling order is there a motion on behalf of the state the state would move to have the court uh, revoke the defendant's bail and remand him into custody uh, pending sentencing bail is revoked bond is discharged and the defendant is remanded to the custody of the hennepin county sheriff anything further all right, all right. thank you so there you have it, the jury in Hennepin County in Minneapolis finding Derek Chauvin guilty on all three counts, second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. Guilty in all three, you can see him being led away there in the courtroom. Uh, he had been out on bail. You heard the state request of the judge that bail be revoked and that he be taken into custody, which is exactly what the judge decided to do. You can see the counts up on your screen right now. The jury deliberating yesterday afternoon uh, and then began deliberating again early this morning, but it was a short period of time uh, before we learned that they had come to a unanimous uh, conclusion. Clearly, they thought that the case made by the prosecution and perhaps that final closing argument, that rebuttal from Jerry Blackwell when he said to the jury, it's as simple as what that nine-year-old girl, one of the bystanders said that she heard the paramedics say when they arrived there more than nine minutes after that knee was put to George Floyd's neck. Uh, she said that she heard paramedics say, get off of him. Of course, in the hours and the days to come, we will learn more from that jury, what they were thinking over the course of this three-week trial. Uh, but we want to look at uh, the reaction coming in from Minneapolis. This was the scene in South Minneapolis just moments ago. They had described the sound of the people gathering there. Obviously erupting. <laughs> Embracing one another and in many ways for that community and for the people who have gathered there, it has been an extraordinarily uh, long year in this country. This was the scene again, George Floyd Square. This is the reaction from the families. George Floyd's family with their legal team, Ben Crump, we know, leading that team, uh, clearly overjoyed. Uh, they believe justice has been served in this case. Derek Chauvin found guilty on all counts. And I want to bring in our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams, as we look at these images. Clearly, the pause there is in between each uh, count uh, as the judge was reading uh, from that piece of paper delivered to him by the, the poor person of the jury. Uh, and Dan, guilty on all counts. They, they believe the prosecution uh, made its case uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Yep, on each and every charge. And remember that there are slightly different theories with regard to second degree murder and third degree murder. I mean, there was a possibility that he could be found guilty of second degree murder, not of third degree murder, and then guilty of second degree manslaughter. That didn't happen. Um, this was a, a prosecution clean sweep here. And now Derek Chauvin will be sentenced on the highest charge, which is second degree murder, faces up to 40 years. The sentencing guidelines in Michigan suggest more likely 10 to 15 years. But I'll tell you, David, you mentioned that nine-year-old girl. And she could be relevant in the context of sentencing. 
because prosecutors can ask for what's called an enhancement in the sentencing, meaning to go beyond what the guidelines would suggest because a child was present. And so that nine-year-old girl was not just an emotional witness, but she could become a very important witness with regard to the potential sentence uh, that Derek Chauvin gets. You heard him, the judge then referring to the Blakely, um, uh, uh, Blakely standard, and that means basically start preparing for the argument over sentencing. And that will be the next phase of this case to determine what the sentence for Derek Chauvin will be. But at this point, um, certainly a big win for the prosecution in this case, getting everything that they asked this jury for. Just to drill down on that point, Dan, as per Minnesota state law, the jury will decide, the judge will decide sentencing on the, on the highest of the charges, which of course is unintentional secondary murder. Uh, the presumed sentence is usually 10 to 15 years, but he faces up to 40 years, and as you mentioned, uh, the, the state will ask for what, what's called an aggravated sentence here, uh, and he could face decades behind bars. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that is going to be, um, you know, really th the next big debate in this case over exactly what should be the sentence uh, for Derek Chauvin. Uh, again, you know, as we talked about when the jury reached its verdict and we said they came back so quickly, this is not good news for Derek Chauvin. Again, on the sentencing side, I wouldn't want to be Derek Chauvin either, meaning that, you know, typically, and, and, and it's not just typically, it's, it's really the vast majority of cases where you're talking about second degree murder or third degree murder. You are talking about up to 15 years. But in this case, um, based on a number of factors, I expect the prosecution to ask for more time, and the judge will, uh, will have to determine that. And David, I want to just add one other quick point, which is about the diversity of this jury. And I think it's important, because we often talk about diversity, and it sounds like a concept, as opposed to something that can actually instill a sense of confidence in people about a verdict. The fact that there were four people who were African American on that jury. There were two who described themselves as multiracial, six whites, and they all came together and very quickly agreed on this verdict. This was a jury of peers, and as a result, I think that that's, that's helpful in instilling confidence in the verdict for the community at large. And Sonny Hostin, as we look at these images coming in uh, from across the country, but first, of course, from Minneapolis, relief in that community. And uh, you yourself said as a former uh, prosecutor yourself, when you heard that there was a verdict and this quickly, that, that even you had thought there would be at least questions from perhaps the jurors for the judge, and there was not. Unanimous, guilty on all charges. Yeah. You know, David, um, I've been a lawyer for 27 years, and I remember when I was in law school during my first year, the Rodney King verdict came out, and it was an acquittal for four officers who, on video, beat and stomped and tased a man, beat a man 56 times with a baton. And I believed my eyes then, so I believed my eyes this time with George Floyd. And even though I knew that fast verdicts always hint at uh, an agreement, even though all of my training told me that they likely convicted on at least the highest count or at least the lowest count, because of the history in this country, because it is so rare that police officers are convicted, because black men and black boys are killed by police with impunity in this country, and that is just the truth, at a rate five times more than their white counterparts. Because I am the mother of an 18-year-old boy who is now in South Africa, and I feel that he is safer in South Africa than he is in his own country. I am so relieved that this is what justice finally looks like for my community. And while I know that this does not bring George Floyd back to his family, 
to his loved ones, to his brother who we've heard from so eloquently. At least I believe now that the movement that we've seen since his murder on video for the world to see is not just a moment. I really believe that this is a movement that we've seen. Um, and for that, I am so, so very thankful that perhaps we will see real change, much needed change in this country. Sonny Austin with some very personal reflections on our coverage this afternoon and the guilty verdict from the jury in Minneapolis. Sonny, thank you. And when you couple what Sonny said and her observations along with what Dan Abrams said just moments before her, that perhaps this could be a unifying moment when you think about the jury and the diversity, the makeup of that jury. Six white jurors, um, six people of color, four black jurors and two who I self-identify as multiracial, that they all deliberated together. And in just a short period of time, were united on what they saw when they watched those nine minutes and what they heard over the course of three weeks inside that Minneapolis courtroom. You can see they have begun to put up signs in Minneapolis. That's the scene from uh, South Minneapolis. Justice served is what that sign says underneath George Floyd's name now. Uh, they've now put that up on the sign. And my colleague, Lindsey Davis, is in Minneapolis. Uh, and Lindsey, the reaction there. David, you know, there was a novel by Terry McMillan, subsequently a movie called Waiting to Exhale. Today it was so much more than that. That was all of us. And just a little while ago, I was telling you about how the streets here were empty. You virtually saw, uh, you hardly saw any people or cars. Well, suddenly now you hear uh, just this celebratory honking. Uh, I saw a, a small group of, of black people walk, walk by who chanted Black Lives Matter. And certainly, you know, this verdict doesn't change our criminal justice system, but perhaps uh, for some, at least for this day, if nothing uh, more beyond that, uh, it does send this message. And uh, for those who consider this to be a win or a victory, perhaps they owe a debt to Darnella Frazier, uh, the 17-year-old who, who shot that video because so much was made of, of the prosecutions uh, saying, but for the knee, right? And, and I imagine many today are saying, but for the videotape, would we find ourselves in this place today? After all, if we go back to how this started, all with a counterfeit $20 bill, uh, a crime that Chief Ardano testified that normally they wouldn't even take somebody into custody for. So, so much jubilation really on the streets here. Lindsay Davis on the ground in Minneapolis for us as we continue our live coverage of the verdict in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Uh, he was a veteran with the police force there in Minneapolis, a 19-year veteran, 45 years old. He's been found guilty of second-degree unintentional murder, guilty of third-degree murder, guilty of second-degree manslaughter. Uh, and we're getting some color from inside that courtroom, and of course the live stream offers the country and the world a perspective that we would not have seen had we not been in this pandemic. The judge saying he was doing this live stream because the community would not be allowed to come into the courtroom and witness uh, at this trial as it unfolded. Uh, but some of what we can't see in that courtroom has just come in, uh, and this is from the print reporter who was inside the courtroom. They're allowing a reporter or two inside that courtroom every day, but because of restrictions just a small number of reporters. Uh, they described the scene as the judge said all rise, the jurors entering that courtroom. Uh, we are told all of them looked serious. None of them looked uh, emotional or that they had been um, teary or that there had been you know, emotions exchanged while they were deliberating, all of them. Uh, in this note that we've been given by the print reporter who was in the room, serious as they walked into the courtroom, Judge Cahill reading the verdicts on that paper as Chauvin stared at the empty witness podium. Uh, and as you saw at home, as we were carrying this live, you know, th this is the era that we're in, the face mask. Uh, there was uh, very little reaction unless you're reading the eyes of, of, of Derek Chauvin. And I do believe we have video of the actual moment. Uh, you won't be able to see much, but here's what we saw. The permanent records of the 4th Judicial District 
State of Minnesota, County of Hennepin, District Court, 4th Judicial District, State of Minnesota Plaintiff versus Derek Michael Chauvin, Defendant. Verdict, Count 1, Court File Number 27, CR 20-12646. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to Count 1, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021, at 1.44 p.m. Signed, juror four person, juror number 19. And that's the reaction from Derek Chauvin as he two. went through each of the, the counts. The above entitled matter as to count two. As you can see. Third degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021, at 1.45 p.m. Signed by jury four person, juror number 19. Same caption, verdict count three. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count three, second degree manslaughter, culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021, at 1.45 p.m. Jury four person, zero one nine. Members of the jury, I'm now going to ask you Derek Chauvin, his reaction inside verdicts. that courtroom, of course, wearing a mask, which yes makes no. it very difficult Juror number two, are for anyone to jury? truly judge at home what the reaction was, though it seemed uh, rather stoic, uh, calm, and as he was led away from the courtroom, no resistance, and that was in the note that he stood up, uh, that certainly his defense attorney prepared him for the very uh, likely scenario that if he was found guilty, that... Uh, the state would ask the judge to revoke bail, which is exactly what they did. Uh, and of course, given his background in law enforcement, he knew that was very likely what would happen if found guilty on really any of the charges. Uh, those are the descriptions uh, from inside the courtroom. And of course, we'll learn more uh, in the hours uh, and the days to come. One of the things that we were struck by today is that even before this verdict was delivered by this jury in Minneapolis. We heard from President Biden at the White House uh, weighing in on this case, and he said he was only weighing in offering what he did uh, because he knew that the jurors in this case had been sequestered and would not hear what the president was saying. Uh, the White House revealing today that he did call the family of George Floyd in the last 24 hours. And I want to bring in our chief White House correspondent, Cecilia Vega, because, Cecilia, you were telling me just before we came on this afternoon that we were actually expecting to hear from President Biden, uh, but that was put on hold. And, and we obviously assumed it was because the White House knew this was coming, not, not what verdict was coming, but that there was a significant development and that we would soon learn it. And David, I know from speaking with sources over the last few weeks in the lead up to this this moment that we are in as a country that they've been trying to figure out the, the right way to have the president speak out and address the nation. Um, I expect that we will hear from him at some point soon. Um, we do know from colleagues that here in the White House uh, who, are, who are inside the White House right now um, that we've seen people. Uh, are, are we going to hear from him? Is that what you're telling me? No, okay, not yet. Um, but we, we have seen preparations, uh, staffers at a podium. So we do expect to, to hear from him. I would not be surprised. We know, uh, David, that the president has been watching this this trial very closely um, and that he has developed a relationship with the, the family of George Floyd. You mentioned that he spoke to his brother today. Um, and the press secretary told us earlier this afternoon that this is, of course, a president who knows intimately what it means to live with grief. And he has that connection with the family of George Floyd and, and that he the president himself has said that he developed a connection with them. But he did make these controversial comments earlier this morning when the president said that he uh, believed that the evidence against Chauvin was overwhelming and that he was praying for the right verdict. He didn't, the White House would not clarify when they were pushed on what that right verdict meant. But David, we know what President Biden has said all along, that he believes that George Floyd was murdered, but that he believed uh, he suffered at the hands of uh, brutality in his death. Um, so, so we also also know, though, that we heard that warning from the judge in the courtroom, Judge Cahill, just yesterday that he warned politicians against making statements on this case for fear that it would taint the jury, even though they are sequestered. The president and the White House have said that he would not have made this statement like this if they were not, in fact, that jury was not sequestered. So they tried to sort of back away from that. But we have heard from defense attorneys in many cases 
um, that it, they believe that it is inappropriate for politicians to comment and weigh in ahead of jury uh, verdicts for fear that they could end up being part of an appeal. Um, it is extremely unusual to hear from a president in a case like this one. Nonetheless, we are here, David. We are waiting uh, from word from the White House when and if we will hear from the president address the nation. I expect that to happen. And one more point I wanted to later. ask you about, Cecilia. One more thing that the president said, and I know that you monitored this as well, is that he said uh, that he knew that the jury uh, was under significant weight in this case, that they, they were aware of what they were going to be deliberating over. He said, I'm praying the verdict is the right verdict, but he also said, I can only imagine the pressure and anxiety they're feeling, and so I waited until the jury was sequestered uh, before I called George Floyd's family. And we heard Cecilia from the judge in this case, too, as he thanked them for their service. Uh, and this is going to be an extraordinary part of the story that unfolds over the course of the next few days, the, the, the weight that these jurors felt, but the judge thanking them for the heavy duty jury service from those jurors. Exactly. Um, and, and President Biden touching on that. You know, David, this is a moment in our country uh, that we are living in as a country collectively that is not lost on this White House, that is not lost on this president. Not just what the jury, not just what everybody in that courtroom went through, not just what the people of Minneapolis and that community and the family are going through, but what this country is going through. And just think back to the campaign. This is a man who campaigned on racial reckoning, who said he got into this race because of what happened in Charlottesville under President Trump. Um, he was propelled in part, large part, into office by the help of African-American voters in this country. That is how he won the nomination. So he feels the weight of this moment and this cultural reckoning uh, that we are in. But David, there is also a political side to this as well. He promised police reform. He pl promised action on police reform on day one, and that has yet to happen. Instead, he is not uh, uh, backing a police commission that he said he would, a study commission. He is instead hoping on action on Capitol Hill that is stalled right now, David. Cecilia Vega monitoring developments from the White House. If and when we hear from President Biden, we will go right back to Cecilia. I should mention that many of our stations in the East uh, might be joining their local news broadcasts, but we will continue until 6 p.m. Eastern. So should we hear from the president, we will bring that to you live. We will also bring you uh, the, the Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, should he speak uh, before we go off the air at 6 for local news here in the East, and then I'll be back on at 6.30 with our entire team. Uh, I wanted to bring in our senior national correspondent, Steve Osinsama. You heard Cecilia talk about uh, the campaign, and we cannot forget that this all played out not only during the pandemic, but in the middle of a presidential campaign and one of the most, if not the most, highly charged campaigns of you know, modern American history. And as Cecilia pointed out, this was something that President Biden uh, did not shy away from. He, he talked about this reckoning in America, this conversation in America, uh, and, and he said it was a conversation that was long overdue, Steve. It's frankly one of the reasons why Joe Biden was able to get so many votes here in Georgia because of that issue. That racial reckoning that happened after this incident uh, not only affected our political world, it, it affected uh, the, our workplaces, it affected our interpersonal relationships. And, you know, I, I want to underline something here. You know, you're seeing a lot of pictures of people celebrating, fist pumping, uh, jumping in the air. But I, but I want to underline that the, the, the thing that they're celebrating isn't the defeat of a police officer. It's the acknowledgement that in this incident, a black life, a black life that many Americans felt this wasn't going to get its proper respect and due was recognized. And the jurors saw that and sided with what should have been, sided with what was justice actually determined that what you saw that the sky was blue, yes, indeed, the sky was blue. That's what I think people are celebrating in the street and, so, and what you're going to hear people celebrating. And, you know, as much as the jury, we all expected, of course, the jury to come back and have its say, we knew that America was going to have its say as well. The streets were going to react to this, and the streets are, are reacting right now with a sense of relief, with a sense of justice, with a sense of equality achieved, because so many of these cases 
David, you and I have reported on many of these incidents where there was video, where it seemed as clear as day, and because of people's feelings about police officers, uh, the officer was not acquitted or it was a hung jury. That didn't happen in this case. You're hearing people chant Black Lives Matter because that's really what this was all about. That was the heart of it. David? Steve Osinsami, who covered the presidential campaign and who covered it from a local level right there in Georgia, uh, and the wide impact that that state had, the voters in that state, their voices, um, shifting power in Washington on a number of levels. I want to bring in Ken Moten, who's reporting from Minneapolis for us. And, and Ken, you learned of uh, late developments involving George Floyd's family. The moment Flonis Floyd, George Floyd's younger brother, walked out of that courtroom, we understand he got a call from President Biden. In fact, we just watched a live stream, a social media live stream, David, from one of the family attorneys where President Biden was essentially congratulating uh, George Floyd's family, also family attorney Ben Crump, and he even referenced what George Floyd's daughter said last summer, that her daddy changed the world, is going to change the world. And so that was a personal conversation the two had. It was on a social media live stream, but we understand and yes, President Biden has reached out to the family. Flonis Floyd actually spoke to the president before the verdict as well. Uh, we know that when it comes to President Biden, he has suffered tremendous loss himself. And so he spoke from uh, that viewpoint, from that aspect. And it was words of comfort to the family as well. But when it comes to inside that courtroom, David, we're hearing also that Flonis Floyd uh, was inside. He was the family member who was inside. There's been at least one family mem member inside that courtroom every single day over the course of this trial. And as as Flonis Floyd heard that verdict, guilty, guilty, guilty. He had his hands clasped over his head and he became shakier and shakier as he heard each count there, guilty. Also, family members are gathered inside a hotel here in downtown Minneapolis. Tears of joy, David, is what we understand, chanting George Floyd's name, just like the demonstrators on these streets chanting that name over and over again, also saying it's an unbelievable feeling in that room. Uh, you mentioned Terrence Floyd, David, that you interviewed last summer. He said he was nervous, angry, but there is this relief that he feels right now. And when it comes to Chauvin being taken away in handcuffs, the family was chanting, yes, that's right, take him away. This is the moment they've been waiting for for so long. They've gotten a big settlement. They've gotten a lot of support from the family, but this is what they were waiting for. And now as we wait to hear from the family within the next few minutes or so, right. David, we understand they're going on to the next chapter of making sure they take this to the next level when it comes to legislation and police reform. David. Next steps from the family, pushing for new legislation, and as Kenneth Moten just reported, police reform. Uh, but perhaps the biggest headline out of Ken Moten's reporting there in Minneapolis is that uh, President Biden called George Floyd's family in the moments after this verdict was delivered in that courtroom guilty on all counts. And we remember when we were broadcasting uh, World News Tonight from Houston on the eve of the funeral for George Floyd, that it was uh, then former Vice President Joe Biden, a presidential candidate uh, at the time, who traveled uh, to Houston to meet with Floyd's family. Uh, he met George Floyd's youngest daughter, uh, met with the family on the day before the funeral. And we remember that during the funeral, uh, there was a videotaped message then delivered uh, from Joe Biden. This has been a long conversation uh, over the course of the better part of a year between um, Joe Biden, who is now the president, and the family of George Floyd. He has not uh, shied away from his support for this family, offering words on this trial, as Cecilia reported a short time ago, only after the president said that he knew uh, the jurors were sequestered and beginning their difficult work of deliberating. Um, but that he hoped that there would be the right verdict. The White House was pressed today by reporters what the president meant by that. Uh, they would not elaborate. That was Cecilia pointed out, the president clearly um, not fearful of how Americans would read that, uh, his choice of words uh, in the hours earlier today before we heard uh, the verdict. I want to bring back in Deborah Roberts, if she's still with us, just because of something that struck me earlier when you were talking about having talked to your son again about this last night, Deb. You know, the video has been out there all year long, uh, but it doesn't get any easier to watch over the course of this trial and that your son often still looks away to this day um, because parents across this country are going to be reacting to the news of this verdict and, and having conversations with their families all over again tonight. 
I think you're right, David, and I think that's what makes it so difficult, and that's why my friend and colleague, Sonny Huston, I think, just sort of lost her composure, and I, and I, I so get that, because I think what was so clear here for so many people, whether you're a mother of color or a, just a person in general watching this, is that, you know, George Floyd was a man whose life should have had value. And yes, he was an imperfect man, he was struggling with the drug addiction, and he had other problems in his life, but I think so many of us, and probably Sonny included, looked at that videotape, you know, with a gun in his face and the way he was treated so quickly over, uh, you know, a fraudulent $20 bill. I think so many of us looked at that and, and we saw our own sons, our own brothers, our own husbands and family members. And you sort of thought that, you know, it sort of represented, I think, sort of this lack of value of a life uh, of somebody of color. And as Steve Osinsami pointed out, David, you and I and all of us have reported on other situations where maybe a white man had an encounter with police. I certainly reported on one where he pulled a gun on the police and uh, he was not shot. He was taken into custody uh, peacefully because they wanted to take him into custody peacefully and they went out of their way not to shoot him. And I think for those of us in the media, we've had opportunities to see cases like that and maybe people at home don't necessarily think about it and process it that way. But I think for so many of us looking at that videotape over and over again of George Floyd just so quickly, the situation escalating and, you know, he's, he's screaming and plaintively asking for, you know, mercy simply to be taken taken into custody in a way that was that was uh, I think that was uh, that was uh, fair and I think so many of us felt that and I think that's the core of the emotion here that it didn't have to be that way and it didn't have to escalate that way it wasn't about whether George Floyd was a perfect man it was really about the fact that he was a man and he should have been treated as such and I think for a lot of people this resonates as sort of a victory in the sense that we need to start regarding people um, you know as as people and and treating them with uh, humanity and respect and um, you know for once people saw justice and saw somebody being held into account because of how that was handled and I think that at the core is what a lot of people will be feeling and talking about tonight and um, maybe actually as Lindsay said exhaling a little bit tonight thinking that maybe the system can recognize uh, bad behavior sometimes in the in, on the place of uh, law enforcement so I think that is David something that will be resonating and being talked about a lot tonight. Deborah Roberts with us for our coverage this afternoon. And as Deb points out, the conversation begins in homes uh, across the country, probably right now as we're on the air, now that we've learned uh, uh, the verdict here this afternoon. And as we heard Ken Moten report just moments ago, President Biden uh, reaching out to the family of George Floyd uh, after the verdict was read. We have not heard uh, publicly from the president yet, but we have learned that he has talked with George Floyd's family. I want to bring in our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, uh, who I believe is at Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C. DC, of course, uh, that was uh, created in the aftermath of what happened to George Floyd and the effort to push for reform and for justice. And, and Rachel, you heard uh, what Ken Moten said there a moment ago, that this doesn't necessarily end this chapter, that the, the Floyd family believes that this is the beginning of a conversation and that the next part of this conversation is how do we make change in this country? Exactly right, David. I mean, I'm standing here in Black Lives Matter Plaza, a plaza that now has the words Black Lives Matter printed in bold yellow letters on this block leading up to the White House. But activists, black people in this country want more than just a symbol. They want change and they want that to come through legislation. We heard Cecilia Vega talk about police reform in this country being stalled. We saw those conversations about police reform from bipartisan group of lawmakers. Those went nowhere after the death of George Floyd. We're seeing those talks sort of resume again, but they want more from this White House. They want more from lawmakers in Congress. Just moments after this verdict was read, I watched one young black man just fall to his knees in tears here, overcome with emotion. I just talked to him. He told me he was out here over the summer as those protests over racial reckoning erupted in this country. He says that he saw himself in George Floyd. And today, David, I'm also thinking about moments that we were on the air during George Floyd's funeral. I remember being out here and I remember a group of protesters were here and they started with the name of George Floyd, but then they went down the names of other black lives that have been taken at the hands of police. Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, so many others. And that really struck to the heart of what this movement is about. It is about change. 
every person that comes out here, people that are gathering here right now, they have stories. They have stories in which they have experienced racial inequality in this country. I remember being out here night after night during the summer, talking to families who brought their children here to have those tough conversations about race in this country, about what it means to be white in America, about what it means to be black in America. But David, every single person that I spoke with said that they wanted change, and that change comes through legislation. Many here today feel like we took one step forward towards that change, David. Rachel Scott reporting from Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, a relatively peaceful scene, though she uh, described in great detail uh, witnessing uh, one young black man who uh, fell to his knees in reaction to the verdict uh, here this afternoon. I, I know that Good Morning America's Michael Strahan has been watching this unfold this afternoon. Uh, Right here along with us, Michael, uh, what do you make of what you've learned here this afternoon and what's your reaction? Oh, David, I appreciate you having me on and I think my reaction is looking at the verdict and you feel as like it is justified. Um, you, you feel maybe this is the changing of the tide. Hopefully you no longer get away with, with killing of a black person. Um, no matter who you are in society, not just as a police officer, but for anyone. And you look at this case, and it, it definitely, you know, black black people in America have been, you know, treated in a different way when it comes to dealing with the police. But this is also about just humanity as a whole to see this as a human being. It was disturbing. And at the end of it all, I think that you see people celebrating and you see people are happy, but it does not bring George Floyd back. It does not, um, um, you know, bring any... Um, anything you had Breonna Taylor, you had Philando Castile, you had all these others who did not get the justice that we see here in the case of George Floyd, but he still has a family who still has to suffer through the fact that, yes, their verdict is guilty, but yet he will never um, walk through their door again. But I think, but as a whole, as a, as a black man in this country and being, you know, as black people in this country, we feel that hopefully this is the changing of the guard. Uh, like a, a change that will show that people in the, in, of color will be treated with the respect and the dignity of everyone else. And it won't be an afterthought. We won't be surprised when something like this happens and the verdict is guilty. We won't be on the edge of our seat hoping that the verdict is guilty when it's very hard um, to, under, to, to understand how it couldn't be. So I, I, just, I just think that this is a, a feeling of hope but yet, I want everybody to keep in mind that there's still a family that's grieving the loss of a brother, a father, and a son. And those things will never go away from that family, regardless of what this verdict does. But it is so good to see that the justice system has made the right decision in this case, and that hopefully this is something that, that, that rings and, and makes change for, for the future of the minorities in this country. Michael Strahan reporting in this afternoon and Michael making an extraordinarily uh, profound point there that it is important that we all remember that there is a family at the heart of this uh, case and at this the heart of this trial, George Floyd's family, and even though uh, we saw their reaction that they do believe justice has been served, that it certainly doesn't bring back their father, uh, their brother, uh, their son. Uh, Michael Strahan, our thanks to you. We, we, we do know that we heard just moments ago from Minnesota's Attorney General Keith Ellison. Uh, here's what he had to say. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Ellison. I'm the Attorney General of the state of Minnesota. And since the investigation and prosecution of this case began last May, everyone involved has pursued one goal, justice. We pursued justice wherever it led. When I became the lead prosecutor for the case, I asked for time and patience to review the facts, gather evidence, and prosecute for the murder of George Floyd to the fullest extent the law allowed. I want to thank the community for giving us that time and allowing us to do our work. The Minnesota Attorney General there, Keith Ellison, uh, talking to the community there, thanking uh, the jury for doing their work and the community. Uh, certainly they had been bracing, uh, not only there in Minnesota and in Minneapolis, for uh, any possible outcome and any potential reaction to that outcome. And so far, obviously, uh, what you're seeing uh, from right there in South Minneapolis, that is the corner uh, where this played out a year ago, Memorial Day, uh, George Floyd Square in front of Cup Foods.
uh, the shrine to George Floyd and you saw the hugs um, and some tears right after the verdict was read uh, from that community. Uh, and as we heard from Lindsey Davis earlier, as we were on the air, uh, the immediate change in, in, in temperature in Minneapolis, on the streets of Minneapolis, that people exhaled, if you will. Uh, that was the word that, that Lindsay used to describe the moment. I want to bring in Cecilia Vega because, Cecilia, we did learn from Ken Moten uh, that President Biden did reach out to George Floyd's family, and we are aware that this has been a, a relationship that the president has forged with this family, uh, not just now, not just during this trial, but all the way back to when the country and the world witnessed this video. Uh, he went to meet with them in Houston on the eve of that funeral, uh, and he's kept in contact with this family ever since. He has, uh, David. They spoke uh, this morning. Uh, they just spoke again. We found out from Kenneth Moden. And, and I do have a little bit of breaking news from the White House just in to tell you about. We don't have many details, but I am told by the White House that the president and the vice president will deliver remarks later this evening, they say, on the verdict. So uh, clearly uh, that is going to happen at some point um, later this evening. But, you know, this is um, this is something that we have heard from this White House and, and, frankly, from this president himself. This is not something that he shies away from. Um, the personal grief and the personal tragedy that he has lived in his own life, having lost children, having lost a wife so tragically young, just as he was being sworn in as a senator here in Washington all those years ago. Uh, and this is a president who very much gov governs as, uh, as, as an empathetic ear. Uh, as someone who connects one-on-one -on -one with people um, and who does not shy away from having those difficult conversations. And in his own uh, memoirs, he has talked about that is how uh, he relates and that is how he thinks when he is inside a building like this one or when he governed all those years in the Senate as, as, as someone who is empathetic, who can really understand the grief and the sadness that people go through. And he talks often uh, to families who are living through such awful uh, tragedies, like the one that the George Floyd family has gone through, that one day, there will come a time, he hopes for them, that there will be a smile on their face when they remember those loved ones, that that smile and those happy memories will overshadow the sad ones. And, and that is, I'm sure, part of the conversation that he has had with this family. Um, we talked earlier about the controversy, the president weighing in uh, on this verdict before the verdict actually happened, uh, saying uh, th th that he was praying for the right verdict. I think we know where the president's mind and heart was on what he, the outcome that he wanted to see, even though the White House wouldn't fill in the blanks. But again, David, we do expect to hear from the president and the vice president at some point sooner than later. And the vice president, I will say, did an, uh, an interview earlier today where she said that this verdict will not heal the pain that has existed for generations. And that is a point that we should should make here, that my colleagues uh, who have been reporting on this story for uh, going on a year now, um, that, that this verdict doesn't end this conversation that needs to keep happening in this country about reform and policing and justice. And I'm certain that that is something the president will hit on today. Cecilia Vega at the White House. We just learned from Cecilia moments ago that President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris will have comments on this verdict, public comments in the hours to come from Washington. We do know that the president talked with the family of George Floyd, a relationship that he struck up with them uh, since not long after this tragedy, which takes us back into the months leading up to the election, of course. I want to bring in Nightline anchor Byron Pitts because uh, as we were talking about with Cecilia there, Byron, it reminds me of part of the case at the prosecution made uh, that they said that this was you know not an anti-police prosecution that this was about former officer Derek Chauvin and in trying to make that point uh, they put up a visual inside the courtroom showing all of the faces of the police witnesses who testified against Derek Chauvin that was uh, extremely rare to see in a case uh, of, of alleged police misconduct we now know that the jury has found him guilty but extremely rare to see the number of faces uh, and, and no particular order, although the police chief himself uh, saying that he did not act in accordance with police uh, policy. Very strong words from the police department. And, and I gather, as Cecilia points out, this is also going to be a conversation that continues and one with political undertones to it. And the president will likely have to thread the needle, uh, essentially, uh, I gather, making a similar case to what we heard from the prosecution, that this isn't an anti-police moment in this country, but that this was about an officer accused of wrongdoing and now found guilty by a jury, a very diverse jury in Minneapolis. That's right, David. A diverse American jury believed their eyes. and. 
Frankly, that's been rare in American history in major moments, that black and white America see the same event and have the same reaction to it. Uh, I have a few thoughts, Dave. I was thinking about what the prosecutor, Jerry Blackwell, said yesterday to your point about law enforcement. He said, being a cop in America, it's about in your custody, in your care, not in your custody, I don't care. So I think this verdict certainly sends a message to law enforcement across this nation about what the public expects of them. I'm also mindful of what Dr. King said in March of 1968. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I would think for people who were satisfied by today's verdict that justice found its sweet spot. And David, lastly, I'm mindful of something, though, that one of the demonstrators, protesters said, a woman gathered down there at George Floyd uh, Square said, as we saw the images of people reacting, the woman said the healing work begins. And I think that's worth noting. For all the optimism that many people may feel in this moment, history has shown us for every success, there are setbacks. I think about, you know, the, that, that pivotal moment in American history when Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech in 1963. Eighteen days later, though, there was a bombing at a Birmingham church and four girls died. So in many ways, this trial was hard, watching that videotape was hard, but the healing work that woman spoke of, history has shown that is equally hard, if not more difficult. So yes, as Dr. King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So perhaps we did find justice today, but there is so much work to be done in police stations, in courtrooms, in corporations across this nation, in homes across this nation. So significant night today, but so much work to come. Byron Pitts of Nightline. Byron, always great to have you help guide the way here uh, with us as we're on the air. You're watching ABC News live coverage of the verdict in the trial against former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Uh, obviously, a short time ago, found guilty on all three counts, uh, found guilty of second degree unintentional murder, guilty of third degree murder, guilty of second degree manslaughter. As I've been uh, explaining as we go, this trial has been different in many ways because it's playing out uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, the judge making the rare decision to live stream the trial, which allowed the country and really the world uh, to watch. Uh, of course, we did not see the jurors and we do have uh, what we call the pool report from the reporter who was allowed in that room, describing uh, the jurors walking into that room rather stoically, uh, no emotion on their face, extremely serious, uh, describing the former police officer Chauvin, studying them, studying the judge as he read uh, the verdict, uh, and then getting up uh, very calmly as he was handcuffed and then escorted out of that courtroom. We heard in the moments right before that the state asking the judge to revoke bail, which we knew they would do uh, if he was found guilty on any of these charges and, of course, on all three, and he was guided out of that courtroom. As we mentioned with Dan Abrams earlier in our coverage, uh, he will be sentenced based on the most serious of those three charges. That's in accordance with uh, Minnesota law. He faces potentially decades behind bars. And Dan Abrams suggested that perhaps as part of that sentencing, they will use uh, what the prosecution used in their rebuttal. Uh, basically going back to the nine-year-old girl. There were so many witnesses there that day, but going back to that nine-year-old girl who said she listened in um, nine minutes, 29 seconds into that moment, uh, the paramedics then arriving, uh, Derek Chauvin still with his knee to George Floyd's neck, and that nine-year-old girl said she could hear paramedics having to tell Chauvin, uh, get off of him. You know, Byron Pitts making the point there uh, that this was a diverse jury, that this was an all-American jury, if you will, six white jurors, uh, four uh, black jurors, and two people who described themselves as multiracial. Uh, perhaps that will uh, offer um, a unifying message as the country digests uh, the verdict in this case and as we begin the conversation about uh, what comes next. I wanted to bring in Terry Austin of the Law and Crime Network uh, because, Terry, in addition uh, to the jury, we heard the defense make that case in the last 24 hours and they did this throughout the trial. They tried to characterize the bystanders there as potential, um, you know, as potential threats to Derek Chauvin, certainly at the very least a distraction to Derek Chauvin. And then we heard that rebuttal from the prosecution, and I'm curious if you think that that rebuttal 
uh, had any impact because obviously they have now decided the way they have. They, they've agreed with the prosecution, but there was that point that he made when he said those, those bystanders, those witnesses, a threat, and, and he basically said, come on, I mean, you saw them, and he pointed out to the jury that you met almost all of those bystanders who had come in as witnesses, and, and Terry, we all witnessed as the nation watched this trial, very emotional testimony from each one of them about what they witnessed, and, and the faces of those witness, witnesses represented all different backgrounds in this country. There is no question that on rebuttal, when Jerry Blackwell mentioned the fact that that crowd was there with the jury, that crowd took the pictures, they witnessed what happened, and they told you as a jury that this was wrong, that this should not be happening. We have a nine-year-old girl who said, just get up off of him. I definitely think that was very impactful. And frankly, I believe that those witnesses who are hearing this verdict are happy. They understand understand that they did their part in this process. They came forward, they told the truth, they were listened to, and I think it's going to affect the entire judicial system, and it will have an incredible impact on the world. Here we are seeing, finally, that individuals are being held individually accountable for their actions, not just passing laws, and those are important, not just having police reform, and that is important, but actually having a police offer being held personally accountable for having used excessive force against an individual of color. I think finally we can sigh a breath of relief, and I think finally we are at a tipping point. And I'll add one last thing. I am here in Harlem. When the guilty verdict came out on all three counts, you could hear all of Harlem cheering, and that is only the second time that I've heard that. The first time? was when we saw Joe Biden get voted for president. And so I think it is astronomical that this is happening, and I think the world is reacting. Terry, stick with us here. I just have a, a note for our audience, for those of you watching. We know that uh, many of our stations might pull away for their 6 o'clock local news. For the rest of the country, we will be staying on with our live coverage, ABC News live coverage of the verdict in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin found guilty today on all charges. Uh, and for those of you who will be going to local news, I'll see you at 6.30 right afterward. In the meantime, Terry, I wanted to come back to you because I wanted your reaction to something we've just learned. Darnella Frazier, who of course captured that video, uh, uh, that was the most important piece of evidence, obviously, in this case. You know, the prosecution had several uh, main pillars in their argument, but the, 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 the most significant pillar of all was, of course, the 9 minutes, 29 seconds that they were able to play of that video, uh, more than 8 minute of it, minutes of it in their opening statement. Darnella Frazier, who captured that video, uh, Terry, this is what she just uh, sent out in, in a tweet, I believe. She said, I just cried so hard this last hour. My heart was beating so fast. I was anxious, anxiety. Uh, through the roof, but to know guilty on all three charges, thank you, God, uh, thank you. And we heard her testify uh, on that witness stand that she has felt guilty uh, since that Memorial Day in South Minneapolis, that she was not able to do more. And today, as, as you heard right there, um, she, she is so grateful, she says, for guilty on all three charges. And I think the other witnesses who came forward will also feel some sort of relief. Obviously, we cannot bring George Floyd back, but I think for the other witnesses who said that they wish that they had done more, obviously the fact that they came in and they testified, they made a difference and the jury heard them loudly and clearly. And it was very smart on the part of the prosecution to bring that back in to his closing statement because the jury really needed to hear that. And I'm grateful that Darnella Frazier learned that this was a guilty verdict on all counts and that she's relieved. And I'm hoping and thinking that the others in that crowd will have some sense of relief. And the family also will have some sense of relief. Obviously, they'll never be the same again. But I do think that having this guilty verdict really makes a difference. I remember when George Floyd's daughter was being held up on, I think it was her uncle's shoulders, and she said, my father made a difference. Her father really has made a difference. This is clearly a tipping point, and I think perhaps going forward, we will see more guilty verdicts when the evidence supports exactly that. 
Terry Austin with us from the Law and Crime Network. Terry, thank you and stick with us here as our coverage continues. We are just learning at this hour of a statement uh, from former President Barack Obama, and I know we're expecting a statement uh, later uh, this evening from President Biden and from Vice President Kamala Harris, but President uh, Obama saying today a jury in Minneapolis uh, did the right thing. He goes on to say for almost a year, George Floyd's death under the knee of a police officer has reverberated around the world, inspiring murals, marches, sparking conversations in living rooms and new legislation, the former president says. But a more basic question has always remained, would justice be done? He said, in this case, at least, we have our answer. And he said, Michelle and I send our prayers to the Floyd family. That just in from former President Barack Obama on the verdict in Minneapolis uh, late today. I want to bring in Lindsey Davis, who is on the ground in Minneapolis with us, our Sunday night anchor, of course, and the anchor of uh, ABC News Live. And Lindsey, you were telling us earlier that you heard it, you could sense it almost immediately, uh, the relief in Minneapolis. Quite a, a bit of calm now. You can imagine at least that the businesses will be able to take the boards down, perhaps the million dollars that Hennepin County spent on, on security, perhaps that was all for naught. And just this palpable sense that you could feel that this was the city on edge. All of a sudden now, it's just a, a kind of a collective calm, if you will. But, you know, certainly the potential for riot was there. If history is any indicator, if you look at in the case of like Arthur McDuffie, for example, who was beaten to death by police in 1979. It wasn't until 1980, after those officers were acquitted, that the riots broke out. Similarly with Rodney King, it was the same thing. Uh, you had, uh, he was beaten in 1991, but the riot happened in L.A. in 1992. And uh, as we heard from uh, the Minnesota governor, who was ramping up, preparing for all possibilities, he was trying to allow for people to say, hey, look, it may not just be uh, that this is anger, that this is riot, that this in some cases is pain and, and heartbreak. And as, as Martin Luther King said, I know Byron quoted him once, but it feels fitting to, to do it again. He talked about how a riot is the language of the unheard. And so perhaps, David, today, no riot. Perhaps people are feeling heard. Not only there in Minneapolis, but perhaps a sense of relief across this nation that there is relative calm uh, after a very lengthy uh, trial, three weeks, uh, 14 days of testimony of the course of those three weeks, uh, and after a year of a racial reckoning, long overdue conversation uh, in this country about uh, race, justice, uh, policing in this country, and, and very serious questions about uh, how we bridge the divide, how we keep the conversation going, how we begin, uh, as the Floyd family said, right after this verdict, the next chapter, uh, Rachel Scott alluding to, and Kenneth Moten also reporting on their hope that there will be legislation that pushes the conversation forward uh, with continued reform in this country. Uh, Terrence Floyd, the brother of George Floyd, uh, one member of the family who's also been out with protesters, we have video that has just come in of him uh, reacting with loved ones. Uh, as we saw earlier, so many uh, of the loved ones watching very closely from George Floyd's family. Uh, we are told that Terrence Floyd also reacting to the news with emotion um, and, and and joy that his his brother uh, has seen justice. Signed your four person juror number nineteen. Same caption, verdict count two. We the jury in the bottom title matter as count two, third degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. As we have seen in these reactions, uh, they watched along with America with that pause in between uh, each of the charges. And now the tears as the family recognizes that that jury listened to three weeks of testimony and found uh, Derek Chauvin guilty on all of the charges uh, in this case. I remember back in Brooklyn, the family gathered there almost a year ago, George Floyd telling me that he was moved by the crowd. I remember him saying uh, black, white, Asian American, Latino, uh, that that meant uh, so much to the Floyd family that this uh, this was a call and a conversation being driven by families in small towns and cities across America, that this was a united conversation. This is Black Lives Matter Plaza, uh, an image of um, 
someone kneeling there after the verdict, and we heard Rachel Scott report earlier uh, that, that she was particularly moved by the reaction as it came in. And, and Martha Raddatz also watching this along with us in, in Washington. And Martha, you were out covering the streets shortly after this tragedy unfolded uh, last Memorial Day, and the juxtaposition between the police presence uh, and the families um, from all different backgrounds. And, and there was, uh, even though such heartbreak at the time, also a hope on some level from everybody that we would be able to move this conversation forward. Absolutely, David. And you know, I walked down to Black Lives, Black Lives Matter Plaza a few hours before the verdict came in. It's a beautiful day in Washington, as you can see from that photograph. You look behind that photograph, that's the White House. And I couldn't help think of those moments last year when they attacked protesters, when police went after those protesters in Black Lives Matter Plaza, before it was named that, and the progress that that has been made. Uh, those police officers uh, uh, told not to respond like that anymore, to be far more careful. There was a helicopter hovering over the protesters that night. Uh, those uh, helicopter crews have, have been disciplined in some way. But I also think about what you said at the very beginning of our coverage today, David, that it was a reckoning of race, justice and policing, and we have talked about that so much this afternoon. But when I listened to that defense attorney, in particular yesterday, talk about Derek Chauvin and what he did uh, during that period of time with George Floyd, he talked about George Floyd as if he was an enemy, not a citizen, an enemy, not a civilian an enemy, and talked about how Derek Chauvin kept responding in different ways and had to reassess and, and, and figure out what was going on in that angry crowd. The job of police, said the prosecutor, is to protect with courage, to serve with compassion. And also, David, I just want to talk about that video. And, and Sonny Hostin so beautifully talked about the history of this and, and seeing that Rodney King video. This video of George Floyd was so intimate. It made the difference in this case. And I can't help thinking how many cases are out there where there isn't video. That's the progress this nation needs. That's what we need to say. Just a few weeks ago, an Army veteran who was in uniform was pulled over for some minor violation. He had both hands out the window. You could tell he was terrified. African-American officer in the Army, and he was pepper sprayed. There is video of that. Thankfully, he wasn't injured beyond that. But those videos make such a powerful difference. But again, we hope that someday as a country, this doesn't happen, even if there is no video. Well, Martha Raddus makes an interesting point there when she talks about the defense attorney in the closing argument yesterday and, and his um, treatment uh, through words of George Floyd on that ground. You know, it was the defense attorney's choice to play that video over and over again as he tried to make his closing argument. And there will be debate moving forward about whether or not that helped or hurt actually with jurors watching that all over again. E e extraordinarily difficult video watching uh, George Floyd on the ground. And, and as the prosecution then rebutted that moment, Martha, uh, reacting the same way that you just described by saying that in custody means in the care of, in the care of police there that day in South Minneapolis. And uh, part of the reaction to the defense's closing argument too, the defense attorney trying to say that you're constantly reassessing the situation. You have to take into account what came before those nine minutes. Uh, prosecution simply saying that Derek Chauvin had nine minutes on top of George Floyd to reassess uh, over and over again whether or not that was necessary force and obviously the jury deciding uh, unanimously and within a short period of time that that was excessive force that it violated policy and that they agreed with not only the police chief but several police witnesses who came forward in this case in a very rare move to testify against uh, one of their own. I want to bring in Alex Perez because we've talked so much about the jurors here and Alex you know the extraordinary measures that they took in Minneapolis
journalists to protect those jurors, um, to, to guide them out with a heavy security presence, and then once the deliberations began, obviously sequestered in a hotel somewhere there in Minneapolis. But I was struck by what uh, the judge said there when he thanked those jurors. Uh, he said, uh, thank you for your service, for your heavy duty jury service. Yeah, David, the judge throughout this entire trial made it a point to make sure that the jury is a priority, that they're going to be giving these very important instructions that they need to follow, and they want the attorneys and everyone else in the courtroom to also abide by the rules that they're supposed to follow. They were escorted in and out of the courtroom every day throughout this trial, out of the public's view. As you mentioned, when once they began deliberating, they, uh, they, they were sequestered. And so the judge charged them with this task of reaching a decision in this case, and he was very careful, telling them not to watch the news, not to follow social media, to make sure that they're focusing on the facts. And he thanked them at the end, as you said, because uh, I think he believes they listened to him and they followed all of those rules. Uh, and on a case like this one, where uh, the pressure is really so high, uh, I think he was grateful to them for their service. And David, you know, we've been seeing these images of George Floyd Square, all of those people gathering there. And I think that's one of the things that sort of stood out from those closing arguments yesterday. You know, the prosecutor took this case, they had this video that we've all seen, but they didn't rely just on the video. They brought in all of these people who were in that neighborhood, who recorded these images, and they let the jury meet them through their testimony. Minute by minute, they explained what they saw happening in that neighborhood. And we saw the defense attorney, during his closing arguments, uh, try to discredit some of those witnesses, saying, you know, this is a high crime neighborhood, uh, sort of casting some sort of doubt on and what these people were saying. But we had the video, we saw the images, and I think the jury had made up their mind. They knew who those voices were that you hear on those images in that video. They knew who those people were, and they knew that they were trying to help someone who was in need of help in that moment, something that they do not believe Derek Chauvin did uh, for George Floyd when all of this unfolded. Um, I also heard uh, people there at George Floyd Square, right after this all happened, David, they started screaming, yelling, let the healing begin. As we've been seeing all of this unfold over the last year, these protests across the country, people are angry, there's a lot of emotion, they want to see change, but at the end of it, I always remember people saying, I want us to heal, I want us to move forward as one. And perhaps, perhaps, just perhaps, this verdict that we saw today, this could be the beginning of that, David. Alex Perez reporting from the very beginning of this case in Minneapolis and then throughout the trial, reporting there just moments ago, let the healing begin, were the words that he heard there in Minneapolis following this verdict. There is reaction coming in from all over the world as we await uh, public comment from President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, the White House indicating uh, a short time ago that they will be speaking in the hour or hours ahead here this evening. Uh, if and when they speak, we of course will bring it to you uh, right away. In the meantime, uh, we've heard from former President Barack Obama and we're now hearing from leaders overseas, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, reacting moments ago saying, I was appalled by the death of George Floyd and welcome this verdict. My thoughts tonight are with George Floyd's family uh, and friends. And this has been Crump you're looking at. He's become a familiar face in this case. Let's listen. Representing the family. His law George partner, Floyd. attorney Justin Miller, yeah. attorney Madeline Simmons, uh, a great Minnesota lawyers, attorney Jeff Storms. Raise your hand, Jeff. Attorney Michelle Godot. And who else we got here? A anybody else? Attorney. <laughs> <laughs> right, we have Attorney Scott Masterson, who's not present. Uh, Attorney Bavani. I, I, I said Michelle. We got Michelle. All right. Uh, and, and just a great group of lawyers. And I want to let you know who we have present here with the family here in Minneapolis for this historic day. We have uh, George Floyd's brothers. We have Felonis Floyd. We have Rodney Floyd. We have uh, Brandon Williams, who's George Floyd's nephew, but was more like a son to him. They call him Woo back in the third ward. <laughs> woo, 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 woo. We have Keita Floyd, Felonis's wife. We have. Terrence. Oh, where Terrence at? Terrence. Terrence. New York, where you at? <laughs> we got Terrence Floyd, um, 
his sisters who are not with us, but we should absolutely acknowledge uh, Bridget Floyd, who hails from North Carolina, his sisters Latanya and Jaja, who hail from Houston, Texas. Yes, yes. We have his cousins, uh, Sharita McGee, Tedra McGee, and Tara Brown. And we have uh, the mother of his daughter, yeah. Gianni Floyd. We have Roxy Washington, and we have Gianna. And so I'll, I'll, I'll make some brief remarks, and then we're going to have Attorney Stewart. Oh, Angela Cousin Paris. Uh, I, Angela Cousin Paris? Yes, and his uncle. And Uncle Selwyn? Vince. Vince. Uh, any more Floyd family? I know it's a big crew. <laughs> AD. 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 AD, the man he came to Minneapolis with. And Adara. So I'll make some brief remarks and then we're going to have Attorney Stewart and Attorney Ramanucci make some brief remarks and then we're going to hear from this family and we're going to try to leave here today knowing that America. We're going to monitor this as it comes in. Ben Crump clearly joined the Reverend Al Sharpton to his right there uh, talking about members of George Floyd's family. Let's, Let's listen to this for a moment. For a please. moment. To proclaim this historical moment, not just for the legacy of George Floyd, but for the legacy of America. The legacy of trying to make America for all Americans. So that George Floyd's victory and America's quest for equal justice under the law would be intertwined. America, let's frame this moment as a moment where we finally are getting close to living up to our Declaration of Independence, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equally, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that amongst them are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Where America, that means all of us, that means black people, that means Hispanic people, that means native people, that means Asian people, that means all of us, America. We frame this moment for all of us, not just for George Floyd. This is a victory for those who champion humanity over inhumanity, those who champion justice over injustice, those who champion morals over immorality. America, let's lean into this moment and let's make sure Reverend Al, that this moment will be documented for our children yet unborn as they continue on the journey to justice, knowing that the blood of George Floyd will give them a trail to find a way to a better America, a more just America, a more just America where Breonna Taylor gets an opportunity to sleep in peace at night without the police busting in her front door. A more just America, where Maud Aubrey gets to run free and not be lynched for jogging while black. A more just America, where Jacob Blake and Anthony McClain and Walter Scott and Laquan McDonald, and all these other black men, Terrence Crutcher, who was shot in the back while running away like Dante Wright was just a week ago, because for some reason, black men running away from the police is more dangerous than young white men who commit mass murders and walk towards the police with an assault weapon Reverend Bryant, like Kyle Rittenhouse in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Wow. 
America, let this be the precedent. Yes. Let this be the precedent where we live up to the high ideals and the promises when we say liberty and justice for all. Those sun-kissed children are included in all. Those children who overcame slavery, the Middle Passage, the Dred Scott decision, Plessy B. Ferguson, Jim Crow, and his much smarter, wiser son, Jim Crow Jr. Esquire. Let this be the precedence where we overcome systematic racism and oppression and that we are a better people and we will leave our children a better world. Ben Crump talking about leaving our children with a better world, hoping that this uh, verdict that we received today from that jury in Minneapolis is the beginning of a next and equally as important chapter in American history. I want to bring in Steve Osinsami, our senior national correspondent, who's been watching this along with me all day long and for the better part of a year now. And Steve, I think Ben Crump certainly had some powerful words there, and perhaps most powerful is when he talks about all of the other families who've been linked, not because they wanted to be, but who've been linked by the same kind of pain and heartbreak. I remember Ahmaud Aubrey's mother talking with her. She attended the funeral uh, of George Floyd, and she said, I never intended to have this bond with these other mothers, but here I am, and we must speak with one voice. You know, it's, it's an unfortunate club now. Ahmaud Arbery. Rayshard Brooks, Sandra Bland. Uh, there are so many names now, I, I, I can't remember them all. Uh, we, we've been covering these for so, so many years. And one of the things that, you know, we, we heard this attorney just say is that this was a victory earned through pain, through the pain of these families, through the pain of Americans who are afraid every time they see a police officer pull up behind them worried that a police encounter might turn south. Martha Raddatz mentioned that incident with the, uh, with the soldier who uh, was in Virginia, who was seen in his army fatigues with his hands up, uh, still being maced by the police officer. And you know, and I, I wanna show everyone in America watching the one thing that has made the difference over the course of time. The one thing that has made the difference are these things, cell phones, where these incidents have been able to be documented. It was, we would tell our teachers and other authority figures about the way that we would be often treated by police and no one would believe us because there was nothing to document it. You just had to go on the word of a young black man. Well, in America today, there are now these devices that document this, that show what is happening on the streets, that may make it hard to change the narrative or change the story. We talk a lot about reconciliation and healing. That only happens when we start speaking the truth about, about what's really happening and it happening in America. And that is what is happening today. David. Steve Osinsami talking about the, the power of Darnella Frazier's video that she captured, the nine minutes. Uh, 29 seconds seen not only here in this country, but across the world. Uh, the mass protests, uh, not just in the United States, but in, in cities really all over the world. We saw images uh, coming in of George Floyd in the aftermath of what we saw from Darnella Frazier's uh, video. And as Steve rightly points out, so much of what we cover now uh, comes to light through the technology that we simply carry around uh, in our hands. Uh, I want to bring in Cecilia Vega because I know we await potential word from President Biden uh, and the Vice President tonight, but we're getting uh, a transcript of the phone call between President Biden uh, and George Floyd's family. I know he reached out to George Floyd's family right after the verdict uh, was delivered, Cecilia. And that call, I'm told, David, was made uh, from the Oval Office with the president, the, the vice president, the first lady. Um, and, and we listened to that call. We were able to hear it uh, because the cameras were there. And the president called this verdict justice. He said that we are all relieved by what happened there today, though the president did convey the message that he understands that nothing will make this better. The president said that he watched every second of this, and we know that he watched this verdict come down from inside the dining room uh, here at the White House with the vice president. 
and uh, and staff. Uh, but take a listen, David, to some of the a little bit of this phone call that we heard the president make to the Floyd family just earlier today. Got to do it. It's feeling better now. Nothing is going to make it all better. But at least God, now there's some justice and right. you know? And you know, I think a, I think a John is coming. My dad is going to change the world. He's going to start to change it now. That's right. Yes. Amen. Yes. He's going to change it now. Yes. So, you've been incredible. You're an incredible thing. I wish I were there just with my arms around you. I'm standing here with Cedric. We've been talking. We've been watching every second of this. And the vice president, all of us. And uh, um, just, I, we're all so relieved. Not just in one word, but all three. Truly on all three counts. And uh, it's, it's really important. I'm anxious to see you guys. I really am. And we're going to get a lot more done. We're going to get police. We're going to do a lot. We're going to stay at it till we get it done. Hopefully this is the momentum for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act to get passed and have you sign. we got to have that and a lot more. Not just that, a lot more. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, this is going to be our first shot at dealing with genuine systemic racism. Obviously what we're witnessing there, Cecilia, is one side of that call. George Floyd's family in the hallway there uh, at the trial just after the verdict. On the other side, as you describe, uh, President Biden, the vice president, and the first lady from right there in the Oval Office. And, and David, it, it's important to, to, I think, after having heard that conversation, just give our, our viewers a little bit of, a, of an understanding of what this George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is, where it stands, and what it would do. This was introduced in the wake of, of George Floyd's death in 2020, and this essentially would ban some of the things that it would do, ban chokeholds and no-knock warrants. It would mandate deadly force be used only as a last resort, and it would uh, set up a national registry for police mi misconduct. But it passed in the House, but right now it is stalled uh, in the Senate. Republicans, their complaint about this act is that the bill would weaken law enforcement and put officers at risk. But this clearly is something that the White House stands firmly behind. The question is whether there is a political appetite to move this out of Capitol Hill, out of the House, frankly, with Dem where Democrats control the House uh, and, and into law to get on the president's desk. You heard the president say right now that uh, this is our this will be our first shot at dealing with genuine systemic racism. I, I do I believe that is the appetite of this White House and certainly of this president. We've talked about how this is something that he did not shy away from in his campaign to get to this White House. But the reality on the ground here, the politics of this and this issue of police reform is that it is just stalled right now on Capitol Hill. Cecilia Vega at the White House with late reporting here this afternoon. Uh, the transcript of the phone call between President Biden and members of George Floyd's family saying that uh, he feels better now. The president saying that to the family saying nothing is going to make it all better, but at least now there is some justice. That's what the president told family members uh, there, and he talked about Gianna, uh, the youngest daughter of George Floyd, who he met when he traveled to Houston uh, for the funeral. Again, Derek Chauvin found guilty on all three charges in Minneapolis today. Unanimous decision from the jury that took just a short time to deliberate in the trial of Derek Chauvin there in Minneapolis. We're going to pause here for a special edition of World News tonight. For those of you uh, who will turn away, it'll be local news in many parts of the country. For others, I'll see you in just a moment here. Stay tuned. Hey everyone, I'm here. Diane Macedo here with continuing coverage of the verdict in the murder trial against former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. The jury in the case has now found Chauvin guilty on all three counts in the murder of George Floyd. Here's the moment the judge read that verdict out to the courtroom. State of Minnesota, County of Hennepin, District Court, 4th Judicial District, State of Minnesota Plaintiff, versus Derek Michael Chauvin, defendant. Verdict count one, court file number 27, CR 20-12646. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021 at 1.44 p.m. Signed juror four person, juror number 19. Same caption, verdict count two. We, the jury in the above entitled matter as to count two, third degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021 at 1.45 p.m. Signed by jury four person, juror number 19. 
Same caption, verdict count three. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count three, second degree manslaughter, culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk, find the defendant guilty. And just like that, Derek Chauvin is found guilty on two counts of murder and one count of manslaughter in the death of George Floyd. Chauvin's bail was then revoked. You can see him being taken into custody there. Meanwhile, here's what was happening away from the courtroom. We saw video after video, moments of people cheering outside George Floyd Square, the scene where this crime happened. This was the reaction from the crowd. Uh, we also heard from Darnella Frazier. She was the then 17-year-old girl who shot the video where that image was taken from, the video that was in many cases the star witness of this case. Frazier posted on social media just a little while ago saying that her heart was busting through the roof watching this verdict comes in. She writes, thank God, thank you, thank you, in reaction to the verdict. Now, the prosecution had asserted that George Floyd died of asphyxia as a result of Derek Chauvin's knee on his neck and the weight of Chauvin and other officers on the rest of his body, and the jury clearly agreed here. I want to go to our legal team, Lance LaRusso and Shauna Lloyd, for more on this verdict. Uh, thank you both for being here. Lance, I'll start with you. What does it tell you that the jury deliberated only 10 and a half hours before reaching this unanimous verdict guilty on all three counts? I think the most telling thing was that they didn't have any questions. I mean, these are difficult legal standards for people who are not in the law enforcement or not in the uh, law realm. So when they weren't asking questions, it seemed like they were pretty set on what the facts were and they were able to apply them. And now when we see that it was guilty on all three counts, it clearly was that they recognized uh, there was a causation on the debt. That's one of the things that I was wondering if they were going to be caught up with. I thought the second degree manslaughter was probably going to be guilty. The other two, it probably took a little bit of them wrestling around with. I think the failure to render aid was probably the most telling thing for the jury. Uh, Shauna, there was so much in this trial in terms of the witnesses that we saw, 45 witnesses at all, most of them, the large majority for the prosecution. And they covered everything from all the bystanders that were there, so much video in this case, and then also hearing from law enforcement officials testifying against an officer uh, in addition to, of course, the medical experts. Was there one part of the trial that you think really sealed the deal here for the prosecution? I actually think it was a culmination. I think in, typically in these types of trials, you may have one or the other of these significant facts. Maybe you have a bystander. Maybe, you know, typically we don't see law enforcement um, testifying in these types of trials. But I think it was the actual culmination that despite who they were, whether it was a 911 officer um, uh, operator, whether it was a paramedic, whether it was a young child, whether it was a law enforcement officer, that they all came to the same conclusion. And I think that culmination and being able to actually see the video so jurors had the time to recognize the moment that they felt this became excessive together was actually the most pivotal thing about this particular trial. And what the jury really was looking at was a combination of all of these factors pointing in the same direction. And legal analyst Terry Austin is joining us now as well. I want to talk a little bit about the, the trial that is ahead, because we still, uh, oh, it sounds like we don't have Terry. So, Lance, I'll, I'll throw this to you. Um, I haven't heard anybody yet address the fact that there is another trial now, because we know that Derek Chauvin was not the only officer there that day. So now that we have this verdict guilty on all three counts, how do you think that might impact the case of the other three officers involved here who are due to be tried in August? You know, it's a very interesting point that you raised. They were rookies. They were younger veterans. They, they were not veteran officers. And I said when I first watched this video, law enforcement officers roundly criticized what happened and what Derek Chauvin did. And when I was asked about it, I said if I was sitting there, I would have grabbed Derek Chauvin by the shoulders and thrown him on the ground. I mean, the bottom line, I know thousands of officers who would have done the same thing. So the only difference is the, the harping on and the mentioning over and over again about the experience level of Derek Chauvin and essentially that he should have known better. It's going to make those other two cases a little bit of a different, um, a different not burden, but a different set of facts to present to the jury. And I think that you know the question right now is whether or not they will actually go to trial or whether they will work out a plea with the prosecution.
And of course, the other big question here is what kind of a sentence will Derek Chauvin face after being convicted on these three uh, counts? I want to bring in my co-anchor, Terry Moran, now for a little bit more on what's next in this trial. Terry? Well, Diane, what's next is sentencing, and it is clear uh, from the proceedings already in this case before Judge Peter Cahill that the prosecution here will want enhanced sentencing. The top count, the most significant count uh, that Derek Chauvin was convicted of, that second-degree murder count, that carries a maximum of 40 years in prison. The others uh, less so. They would likely not be served uh, sequentially, but the prosecution is looking at enhanced, an enhancement. They've already asked for a hearing before the judge because they want uh, a tougher sentence. So what you're seeing there, while second-degree murder is a max of 40, it is generally sentenced under guidelines uh, in the state of Minnesota, 10 to 15, prosecutors would like to see that enhanced under those same guidelines. One of the factors that can enhance a sentence is if a crime is committed uh, in front of a child. A crime of violence like this is committed in front of a child. You'll remember the nine-year-old bystander eyewitness who took the stand in this trial, and that would be an avenue to enhance the sentence uh, that prosecutors are seeking. Either way, it is going to be a long sentence, and the judge does have the option of either, uh, because he's been convicted of three crimes, of having uh, Derek Chauvin serve uh, all those sentences uh, at the same time, combine the time, or sequentially that he could end up 30 decades in prison for what has happened. I want to go to uh, Kenneth Moten on the scene in Minneapolis uh, and talk a little bit about, Kenneth, uh, the Floyd family, uh, the family that has been through so much, so much grief and stress, and then the nation and the world uh, watching as well, the uprising in this country, all centered around their loved one, George Floyd. What can you tell us about? what they've been going through since the verdict now. We will truly never know what George family's, George Floyd's family has gone through over the past 10 months or so, Terry. And if you think about it, and it was, it's hard to think about it, a loved one um, that you see on national television across the globe in cell phone video dying. Imagine seeing that cell phone video almost every day after the incident happened, seeing that video during this three-week court trial, that's a lot to carry. That's a lot to handle. And we know this family is still suffering the trauma from the death of their loved one. And so there are people who've said all types of things about George Floyd. There have been a lot of supporters, but there have also been critics. And there are people who believe uh, a lot of things when it comes to that interaction with police. And the family has heard it all. And so they've gone through this past 10 months hearing many of those things, experiencing so much. And again, to see that video, to see their brother, their uncle, their father take his last breath under the knee of a person who was sworn to protect and serve is heavy. And again, it's something that we truly could never understand what that moment feels like, what it feels like to go through that situation and see that video. And so for this family, Terry, Diane, tears of joy. It's the first reaction we got after that verdict. We've seen the video. We saw a very boisterous uh, family that was cheering, chanting George Floyd's name. They were obviously relieved. I'm excited about this verdict. But when they truly you know, sort of calm down, they think about the fact that, yes, our George Floyd is gone, and he left this world this way. And so for this family, as I mentioned, I keep using the word trauma because it is very traumatic what they went through and what they're going through. And so now they're finding, um, I guess, peace, you would say, um, and also a sense of uh, a renewal that they need to go to the next chapter. And that's why they're talking about police reforms and the George Floyd Legislation and Policing Act in Congress as it makes its way. And also there are other laws that are making their way through other states that deal with policing and communities and police brutality, all in the name of George Floyd. And so we, when we, t we talked to the family uh, over the course of the past hour, hour and a half or so since that verdict, 
and they said there's still work to be done and they know that and so that is a burden to carry as well uh, a lot of people like to mention the 27 million dollar settlement yes that's a big number but they cared about George Floyd a lot more than they care about that money. And so they're gonna use that. They're going to establish whatever they can and use those funds uh, to help carry the way and to help move on to the next chapter in this. And so again, some of that family reaction, uh, they got that call from President Biden. We've seen some of that video of them speaking with the president and the president saying that uh, nothing is going to make it all better, but at least there is some justice now. Um, he said to the George Floyd family members there, you've been incredible. You're an incredible family. He talked about Gianna, George Floyd's daughter, who we remember, she said, my daddy's gonna change the world. The president mentioned that as well. And so there were some words of comfort for this family as well. But again, Terry and Diane, they feel like they've got a lot of work ahead here. Yeah, Kenneth, and, and we're going to dig a little deeper into kind of the broader impact that this case is likely to have. But I want to go back to our legal team again first, Lance LaRusso and Shauna Lloyd. Uh, Lance, to that point, you know, we we know the jury was instructed to avoid the news and not talk about the trial, and, and the, the attorneys tried their best to really select a jury that could do that. But how challenging was it for both the attorneys on both sides of this case and the jury to be operating knowing the larger impact this case is going to have? It's very difficult, and I'm, I'm glad that the judge was able to sequester them because now there'll be more confidence in the, in the verdict. But you know, it's completely irresponsible for people to be out there saying if the verdict didn't go the way it was supposed to go or the way they wanted it to go or the way it should have gone, that there should be rioting and violence in the streets. That, that rhetoric has got to stop. I mean, we've had officers ambushed who have been doing nothing but wearing a uniform and killed. Uh, you know, there were five officers murdered in Dallas who were providing security at a, a Black Lives Matter rally that was an anti-police rally, an anti-law uh, enforcement brutality rally. So, you know, at some point, people need to ratchet down the rhetoric and try to work on being productive with change if that's what they're trying to do. And stopping training, reducing funding is not the way to fix them. Well, let me bring in uh, our law enforcement voice. Uh, Robert Boyce, who's former chief of detectives at the New York City Police Department. Bob, I, I wonder, put yourself in the shoes uh, a long time ago, I'm sure, of, of, of somebody just joining police force somewhere in this country. We need our police, obviously. We value them. It's, uh, they're part of our communities, an essential part. What's going on? What kind of conversations are happening among the younger police officers who've joined uh, uh, communities that, to, to serve their communities in that way? given this, this verdict and the action on which it was based. I can't hear him. I guess he's, you're, you're muted. You're muted, Bob. Hey, Terry, I'm sorry. All right. Um, All right. Well, show, there he is. Give it a try. So I would tell young officers, and, and recruitment has been challenged, to get young police to start coming off, uh, off the, on the job. I would tell them this, this scarred the nation, also scarred law enforcement, and it's gonna change the way people look at us. We have to get that back. I will tell you that I watch TV all the time, watch instances across the country, and some I emphasize, emphasize with, uh, with the, police, so the police officers, others I, I, I don't. But this, um, I think everyone was, was outraged. Was, uh, was disgusted by these, this, this particular video. This video changed American policing. It changed how people look at us. We have to, a lot of work to do to get back public trust. I see it happening now. And I, he's, and I think the prosecutor here said that uh, it didn't represent law enforcement. I believe it's, it's true. This was uh, repugnant to all of us. So I would tell young officers that uh, it's a different world out there and to take care of each other, look after each other. So when you see someone acting in this, in, in this uh, behavior, any other officer, jump in and stop it immediately. And that's where the change is going to come from. Uh, Shauna, what about the legal impact of this case? Because not only was there so much video here, but it was also unique in the number, the manpower of the prosecution here. Uh, some of them were working pro bono, but could we see this change the way cases like this are approached, both in the fact that we're just naturally going to see more video going forward in cases like these, but also in the kinds of resources that we see the, the state or the district dedicate to a case like this? 
Absolutely. I think you're going to see a change not only in the way these cases are approached. I mean, typically, when we approach these civil rights cases, we are looking to get into video. We're hoping that bystanders are taking video. We're going to start to see a lot more of that, I think, as this case is going to shape the way people look at others when they're being pulled over or when the police are doing something that they feel like is something they shouldn't be doing. I think it's also going to talk about the resources of the state versus the typical criminal defense attorney. Typical criminal defense attorneys are on their own. Their resources are not as much as a state. Um, But the, the the deck is typically stacked for the state in that typically we don't see law enforcement that are willing to cooperate with these types of cases. We're not seeing the level of support support and information that we had in this particular case with these types of witnesses. So I think that this is going to have a broader implication in just the way people come to their jobs, the way law enforcement deal with other law enforcement that they feel may not be doing the right thing or commending the ones that are. So I think you're going to see a lot broader implications in just the way, not only in the legal system, but the way the legal system interacts with law enforcement and the way law enforcement interacts with the legal system. And Sean, if I can follow up on a, on a broader question, juries in America uses juries for civil and criminal cases more than any other country in the world, and, and partly because we recognize them as expressing something about us. For a long time, you know, back to Emmett Till and, and before, all white juries expressed contempt for black life and, and, and for, for, for black Americans. It, does this verdict speak something else? Or is that to Pollyanna an attitude? I think this verdict does speak to that. I think we saw a, a, a jury that was very diverse. It spoke more to the population. It spoke to having different varying views, point of views. It was racially diverse. So I think that it was age-wise, it was diverse. This was a very unique jury that we don't see. I think this is going to encourage people to actually live up to their civic duty to participate in juror, juror um, participate in being a juror. It's such an important part of the American process. It's such an important part of the legal process that we get people of varying backgrounds, socioeconomic, education, racial. It's, it's, this is a vital part of what we do as civil rights attorneys because we need those voices to come together to make these kind of decisions. And so I think this case shows why it's important, and I hope it encourages people to answer that jury summons and to participate in the legal process. And I want to drill down on that a little deeper in terms of the broader impact and bring in Wisdom Powell, director of the Yukon Health Disparities Institute, uh, to talk a little bit more about that. Wisdom, you and I have spoken before about the impact that this case has had on, on the world, but particularly the black community. So I wonder, what do you think the impact is and will be now that we have a verdict? So it's great to be back. And I like many other Americans, was waiting with bated breath for this verdict. I think we have to be really aware and honest that we have experienced a cumulative wounding. And that cumulative wounding has occurred as a consequence of longstanding inequities, which means that while this verdict um, is one that we all hoped and many of us prayed for, we also know that this is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. And so I want us to all think about the power that lies in not you know, regressing to the mean and going back to business as usual. What we need now in this nation, in this moment of racial reckoning, is radical healing. And that kind of radical healing can only occur if we are courageous enough to hold space for the grief, the loss, and to also take the steps to remember, that is, to put back together that which racial injustice and violence has torn apart. And, Wisdom, if I can follow up on, on this, this issue, you, we are talking about the relief and the sense of, of vindication, of, of being seen and being recognized that many people have. There are people on the other side. There are people who fear what? Loss of status, loss of power, loss of, uh, loss of the old ways. And not that people were rooting for uh, Derek Chauvin uh, to, uh, to inflict that act, but that the justice system speaks, it speaks, uh, you know, about power. 
And there are people who are afraid in this country of losing power. Do you think that's a part of what's happening tonight in, in some places as well? Absolutely. Racism ultimately is a virus itself, right, that operates at, like, carbon monoxide. Odorless, difficult to detect, but equally as noxious. That means we all breathe it in and we all absorb the sort of power grab that occurs when we are in systems that perpetuate racism and inequities. So, of course, power or the, or the desire to hold power is at the root of racism. But we also have to recognize that in order to move towards radical healing, something that we all need and all want, we have to be willing to concede, yield, and share power. And in this moment, if we're really rising up to meet BIPOC communities, black communities, at their highest intentions for healing and restorative justice, then we would be willing to give up seats, transfer power, and create space for those individuals who have been historically marginalized and cast out because of systemic inequality. And do you think, Wisdom, that we're going forward uh, or in some ways, it almost feels like a one step forward, a couple steps back. It feels like there's an open, an open white nationalism being expressed in our country, an open uh, de desire to, to stop the kind of progress that this verdict for many people represents. I think that speaks volumes to the deep entrenchment of these ideologies and the, the fact that we are dealing with, with a virus that is chronic, persistent, mutates, takes on new hosts, and emerges in more virulent forms. So yes, we're seeing a rise in white nationalism. We're seeing a rise in political divisiveness. That's not surprising. But what we can do about it is to, in this moment, not accept that as something that has has to be. We have the power in this nation, in this moment, to move the needle on these issues in ways that I think we haven't had before. In this moment, we've seen communities from all over the globe stand in uh, harmony, unity, with locked arms, all chanting verbally, you know, in unison, um, their desire for more collective healing. So if we are wise, then we would listen to that and we would create the kind of systems change that is required to actually mount a sustained commitment to ending racism once and for all. Look ahead. We also have to remember that this case isn't over yet. Sentencing is scheduled for eight weeks from now. And as Terry pointed out, there are some grounds that the prosecution can use uh, when it comes to sentencing uh, or the judge to give a higher sentence than is usual for these charges. So what are you looking out for there? I think, you know, none of us um, especially those who are in the business of healing justice and restorative justice, are wanting people to end up in carceral settings suffering. That is not what we want. What we want is an end to the senseless killings of black and brown people across our nation. What we want are systems changes that actually make the individual level choices and decisions that, that create racism actually powerless to create the structural barriers that we all endure. And so I do think that we're not over the, the, the mountaintop yet, and we'll still have to wait to see what are going to be the psychological and emotional implications of the sentencing, and what will happen when we all are finally able to really, truly exhale and know that we have put this issue to bed. But that does not mean that we should cease fighting to end injustice. We are standing at this proverbial river twice because in the past, we have neglected our responsibility to remember. Right now in the country of Rwanda, they are in the midst of remembering the genocide against the Tutsi. 27 years later, they are still working on healing and restorative justice. And they do that in the name of remembering, not forgetting. So if we're going to take some wisdom and lessons from those around the globe who are doing this work better with less, then we would, we would lean in to the past, remember it, and absorb all the lessons that are necessary to keep us from standing at this critical precipice again, to keep us from being at another place where we're sitting in a courtroom waiting on another verdict for another crime against humanity like we've seen today. I pray that that's not where we end up.
Amen to that. Thank you. It will take a lot of work, and I'd like to ask Robert Boyce, a former chief of detectives at the NYPD, uh, about going forward. These are such hard conversations, aren't they? Uh, you know, uh, if, uh, on one hand, police and public officials who are charged with, uh, you know, providing public safety. On the other hand, people who've been victims of injustice for generations. And uh, that is a hard, that's a hard uh, political and just personal conversation. How, 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 how do you make progress on that? Do you, do you have hope that we can? Because you've talked about we have to change what we do, police officers. Uh, how do you see that going forward, those kind of conversations? Terry, it's, it's, it's actually ironic because the police officers say, I did 35 years in the street. And you, uh, you, see, you see the inequities of society more than anybody as a police officer. You see the poverty, housing, um, uh, education. You see all those things. So you understand it. You understand what we're up against. And unfortunately, a lot of it falls on the police officers' uh, shoulders to handle that. Um, so I think these are tough times. I, I think we're going to come out of it better. Uh, American law enforcement will come out more trained, more, more recognizing uh, tough situations, people in emotional distress, uh, people who are under the influence of drugs. This is tough training that we have to go through. We have to react much better than we are now. And I see it happening. It's just that's not happening fast enough, to be honest with you. But I see police, police departments across the country changing. And in this national conversation, this discourse that we're having, only helps us get to that point. So I'm optimistic. I know it's a tough road in front of us. Uh, but this today, today, let it be a, a benchmark that we go forward from this point on. I think that's certainly something we can all agree on today. Robert Boyce, Kenneth Moten, Lance LaRusso, Wisdom Powell, and Shauna Lloyd, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. And again, just to recap for you, Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer charged in the death of George Floyd, has now been convicted on all three counts, convicted on second-degree murder, third-degree murder, and second-degree manslaughter for what happened to George Floyd on May 25th. The jury deliberated for 10 and a half hours before issuing this verdict. Sentencing for Derek Chauvin is now scheduled for eight weeks from now. He could be sentenced concurrently, serving those sentences at the same time. The judge could opt instead to have him serve those sentences separately, and he could face anywhere between 10 years and 40 years for those sentences. So we will await that trial. And again, he was not the only officer there that night. The other officers involved in this incident will also be tried for their actions. That trial is expected in August. So, of course, we'll be watching all of these developments for you. And tonight we will have a full wrap-up as well on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis and again tomorrow morning on ABC News Live Update. Until then, everybody, have a good night and stay safe. Thanks for watching. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. Guilty on all counts. After 10 and a half hours of deliberations, we have a verdict. The 12 members of the jury finding Derek Chauvin guilty of murder, guilty of unintentional murder, guilty of second degree manslaughter. All the while Chauvin watching with a mask on with little emotion visible, then let off now in custody of the state of Minnesota tonight, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Outside the courtroom, first silence as the verdict came in, then relief and vindication. Find the defendant guilty. George Floyd's family hearing the verdict along with the rest of us. President Biden also weighing in tonight. Nothing is going to make it all better, but at least God, now there's some justice. We're in Minneapolis tonight monitoring the reaction here with our entire team and the reverberations across the nation and around the world tonight. A special edition of ABC News Live Prime starts right now. Good evening, 
everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis coming to you from Minneapolis tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. There was a novel and a movie by Terry McMillan called Waiting to Exhale. And that was so many of us today waiting for that verdict. As the word came down late this afternoon, a verdict was coming. A rare moment that had the entire country transfixed, watching, waiting, and many hoping that this time would be different. As the judge read the jury's verdict in the courtroom, guilty on all counts, including murder. Derek Chauvin showing very little reaction as he learned his fate. The streets erupting here in Minneapolis and across much of the country. Relief, vindication, and celebration. We could hear some people chanting Black Lives Matter from where we are here. Similar scenes playing out across much of America. And this is a look now at George Floyd Square, the corner of 38th in Chicago, outside of that Cub Foods when this all happened. Floyd's family reacting in real time as well. We're standing by to hear from George Floyd's brother. President Biden calling the family tonight moments after that verdict was read. Uh, people are breathing a sigh of relief tonight. Many pointing out it does not bring George Floyd back. It does not bring Breonna Taylor back. It does not bring Dante Wright back and too many more. The question tonight that many are also asking is will this be the first step to real change? We'll have extensive coverage of this verdict and what comes next. Our Alex Perez has covered every day of this trial and leads us off once again tonight from Minneapolis. Members of the jury, I will now read the verdicts. The jury deliberating just 10 and a half hours and with the nation watching, Judge Peter Cahill reading their unanimous verdict. We the jury in the above entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. Verdict count two. We the jury in the above entitled matter as to count two, third degree murder perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. Verdict count three. We the jury in the above entitled matter as to count three, second degree manslaughter, culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk, find the defendant guilty. The jury of seven women and five men, which included six people of color, stayed late last night and came in early this morning. They worked swiftly and didn't send out a single question during their deliberations. Are these your verdicts? So say you one, so say you all. Yes. 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 In Houston, George Floyd's family members, including his older brother, watching as the verdict was read. Find the defendant guilty. Find the defendant guilty. Here in Minneapolis, other family members erupting. And in George Floyd Square, near where he was murdered, jubilation. The prosecution built their case around that video seen around the world, the 9 minutes and 29 seconds that sparked a racial reckoning movement, telling jurors, believe your own eyes. It's exactly what you knew. It's what you felt in your gut. It's what you now know in your heart. This wasn't policing. This was murder. The teenager who shot that video, Darnella Frazier, taking the stand, testifying off camera. Like so many eyewitnesses, she's still haunted by what she saw. When I look at George Floyd, I look at, I look at my dad, I look at my brothers, I look at my cousins, my uncles, because they are all black. I look at how that could have been one of them. It's been nights. I stayed up apologizing and, and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more. Fair or firm. A dozen law enforcement witnesses, including the Minneapolis chief of police, testified against Derek Chauvin. To continue to apply that level of force to a person proned out, handcuffed behind their back, um, that, that in no way, shape, or form is anything that um, uh, is by policy, is not part of our training, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. The prosecution's medical experts were blunt. A healthy person subjected to what Mr. Floyd was subjected to would have died as a result of what he was subjected to. Chauvin opting not to take the stand in his own defense. 
I will invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege today. His attorney calling just seven witnesses to the prosecution's 38. They sought to convince jurors that George Floyd's heart disease and drug use led to his death, not Chauvin's knee on his neck. Derek Chauvin did exactly what he had been trained to do over the course of his 19-year career. The use of force is not attractive but it is a necessary component of policing. But the jury was not convinced, and tonight we have their judgment. What Derek Chauvin did to George Floyd wasn't policing, it was murder. The former officer put in handcuffs himself as he was let out of court. Alex Perez, kind enough to join us now live from Minneapolis. First of all, thank you for all your tremendous coverage that you've been doing. Uh, we saw Derek Chauvin taken away into custody today. What's next as far as sentencing? Well, Lindsay, uh, the judge said sentencing would be in about eight weeks from now. He faces up to 40 years behind bars. Now, the judge has a lot of sort of leeway here. He can consider many, many factors, but he faces up to 40 years behind bars, and that'll happen in eight weeks, we believe. And also a tweet late today after the verdict came out from Darnella Frey. What did she have to say? Yeah, Darnella Frazier, she's the one that recorded that video that the world has seen, the video that sort of sparked all of this. She tweeted late tonight after that verdict. She said, George Floyd, we did it. Justice is served. Darnella Frazier, just 17 at the time. Alex Perez, our thanks to you. And now Elwin Lopez, also here in Minneapolis. She joins us from outside of the courthouse. And Elwin, you were there with the crowds as the verdict was read this afternoon. Just describe that moment and the reaction outside of the courthouse for us. Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. So we were outside the courthouse when that verdict was read. At the beginning, there was complete silence, and then all of a sudden, there were cheers, a palpable sense of relief outside the courthouse. People were hugging each other. They were crying. And now we've been marching with that group from the courthouse, and the chance that you are hearing not only the name of George Floyd, but also the name of Dante Wright. And a lot of people here telling us, listen, And that's what we're seeing here as we're stopping. I want you to listen to what some people are saying here as they're cheering. Okay, that just died down. But they've been cheering Black Lives Matter. They've been cheering Say Their Names, cheering George Floyd's name, but also Dante Wright's name. Here you're seeing a poster that says, these are not hashtags. These are names. These Ellen, are people's we're families. We're going to for a moment and because we see... Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris right now from the White House. I want to thank Mr. Floyd's family for your steadfastness. Today, we feel a sigh of relief. Still, it cannot take away the pain. A measure of justice isn't the same as equal justice. This verdict brings us a step closer, and the fact is, we still have work to do. We still must reform the system. Last summer, together with Senator Cory Booker and Representative Karen Bass, I introduced the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. This bill would hold law enforcement accountable and help build trust between law enforcement and our communities. This bill is part of George Floyd's legacy. The President and I will continue to urge the Senate to pass this legislation, not as a panacea for every problem, but as a start. This work is long overdue. America has a long history of systemic racism. Black Americans, and black men in particular, have been treated throughout the course of our history as less than human. Black men are fathers, and brothers, and sons, and uncles, and grandfathers, and friends, and neighbors. Their lives must be valued in our education system, in our health care system, in our housing system, in our economic system, in our criminal justice system, in our nation. Full stop. Because of smartphones, so many Americans have now seen the racial injustice that black Americans have known for generations. The racial injustice that we have fought for generations.
that my parents protested in the 1960s, that millions of us, Americans of every race, protested last summer. Here's the truth about racial injustice. It is not just a black America problem or a people of color problem. It is a problem for every American. It is keeping us from fulfilling the promise of liberty and justice for all. And it is holding our nation back from realizing our full potential. We are all a part of George Floyd's legacy. And our job now is to honor it and to honor him. Thank you. And now it is my great honor to introduce the President of the United States, Joe Biden. Today, a jury in Minnesota found former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin guilty on all counts in the murder of George Floyd last May. It was a murder in the full light of day, and it ripped the blinders off for the whole world to see the systemic racism the Vice President just referred to. The systemic racism is a stain on our nation's soul. <clears throat> the knee on the neck of justice for black Americans. Profound fear and trauma. The pain, the exhaustion that black and brown Americans experience every single day. The murder of George Floyd launched a summer of protest we hadn't seen since the civil rights era in the 60s. Protests that unified people of every race and generation in peace and with purpose to say enough, enough, enough of this senseless killings. Today, today's verdict is a step forward. I just spoke with the governor of Minnesota to thank me for the close work with his team. And I also spoke with George Floyd's family again. A remarkable family of extraordinary courage. Nothing can ever bring their brother, their father, back. But this can be a giant step forward in the march toward justice in America. Let's also be clear that such a verdict is also much too rare. For so many people, it seems like it took a unique and extraordinary convergence of factors. A brave young woman with a smartphone camera, a crowd that was traumatized, traumatized witnesses, a murder that lasts almost 10 minutes in broad daylight for ultimately the whole world to see. Officers standing up and testifying against a fellow officer instead of just closing ranks, which should be commended. A jury who heard the evidence carried out their civic duty in the midst of an extraordinary moment under extraordinary pressure. For so many, it feels like it took all of that for the judicial system to deliver a just, just basic accountability. We saw how traumatic and exhausting just watching the trial was for so many people. Think about it, those of you who are listening. Think about how traumatic it was for you. You weren't there. You didn't know any of the people. But it was difficult, especially for the witnesses who had to relive that day. It's a trauma. On top of the fear so many people of color live with every day when they go to sleep at night and pray for the safety of themselves and their loved ones. Again, as we saw in this trial from the fellow police officers who testified, 
Most men and women who wear the badge serve their communities honorably. But those few who fail to meet that standard must be held accountable, and they were today. One was. No one should be above the law. And today's verdict sends that message. But it's not enough. We can't stop here. In order to deliver real change and reform, we can and we must do more to reduce the likelihood that tragedies like this will ever happen and occur again. To ensure the black and brown people, or anyone, so they don't fear the interactions with law enforcement, that they don't have to wake up knowing that they can lose their very life in the course of just living their life. They don't have to worry about whether their sons or daughters will come home after a grocery store run, or just walking down the street, or driving their car, or playing in the park, or just sleeping at home. And this takes acknowledging and confronting head-on systemic racism and the racial disparities that exist in policing and in our criminal justice system more broadly. You know, state and local government and law enforcement needs to step up, but so does the federal government. That's why I've appointed the leadership of the Justice Department that I have, that is fully committed to restoring trust between law enforcement and the community they are sworn to serve and protect. I have complete confidence in the Attorney General, General Garland's leadership and commitment. I've also nominated two key Justice Department nominees, Vanita Gupta and Kristen Clark, who are eminently qualified, highly respected lawyers who have spent their entire careers fighting to advance racial equity and justice. Vanita and Kristen have the experience and the skill necessary to advance our administration's priorities to root out unconstitutional policing and reform our criminal justice system, and they deserve to be confirmed. We also need Congress to act. George Floyd was murdered almost a year ago. There's meaningful police reform legislation in his name. You just heard the Vice President speak of it. She helped write it. Legislation to tackle systemic misconduct in police departments, to restore trust between law enforcement and the people they're entrusted to serve and protect. But it shouldn't take a whole year to get this done. In my conversations with the Floyd family, I spoke to them again today, I assure them we're going to continue to fight for the passage of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act so we can, I can sign the law as quickly as possible. There's more to do. Finally, it's the work we do every day to change hearts and minds as well as laws and policies. That's the work we have to do. Only then will full justice and full equality be delivered to all Americans. And that's what I just discussed with the Floyd family. The guilty verdict does not bring back George. But through the family's pain, they're finding purpose. So George, George's legacy will not be just about his death, but about what we must do in his memory. I also spoke to Gianna, George loves George's young daughter again. When I met her last year, I've said this before, at George's funeral, I told her how brave I thought she was. And I sort of knelt down to hold her hand. I said, Daddy's looking down on you. He's so proud. She said to me then, I'll never forget it, Daddy changed the world. When I told her this afternoon, Daddy did change the world. Let that be his legacy. A legacy of peace, not violence, of justice. Peaceful expression of that legacy are inevitable and appropriate, but violent protest is not. And there are those who will seek to exploit the raw emotions of the moment, agitators and extremists who have no interest in social justice, who seek to carry out violence, destroy property, fan the flames of hate and division, can do everything in their power to stop this country's march toward racial justice. We can't let them succeed. 
This is a time for this country to come together, to unite as Americans. There can never be any safe harbor for hate in America. I've said it many times. The battle for soul of this nation has been a constant push and pull for more than 240 years. A tug of war between the American ideal that we're all created equal and the harsh reality that racism has long torn us apart. At our best, the American ideal wins out. So we can't leave this moment or look away thinking our work is done. We have to look at it, we have to, we have to look as, as we did for those nine minutes and 29 seconds. We have to listen. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Those are George Floyd's last words. We can't let those words die with him. We have to keep hearing those words. We must not turn away. We can't turn away. We have a chance to begin to change the trajectory in this country. It's my hope and prayer that we live up to the legacy. May God bless you. But may God bless the F George Floyd and his family. Thank you for taking the time to be here. This can be a moment of significant change. Thank you. And there you have the remarks concluded from President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. President Biden saying that we need to confront systemic racism head on. And uh, the Vice President saying a measure of justice isn't the same as equal justice. I'd like to now bring in our correspondent, Rachel Scott, who joins us live from Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C. We'd love to just get your reaction there to the president's message after the verdict. What was notable to me, Lindsay, was actually the change in tone that we have seen from this administration compared to the previous administration. I was out here night after night on the air with you, Lindsay, uh, as President Trump responded to the outcry, to the outrage following the death of George Floyd, calling protesters thugs and never actually acknowledging systemic racism as an issue in this country. What we heard from that podium today from both President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, the nation's first black and Asian American vice president, was a different tone, starkly different, saying that it cannot stop with just this guilty verdict, saying that there needs to be reform. President Joe Biden was deeply affected by the killing and the death of George Floyd. The White House says it redoubled his commitment to racial equality and racial equity in this country. He's calling on Congress to act. He's calling for change. And he also made it clear today that he believes that the death of George Floyd was a murder. Take a listen. It was a murder in the full light of day, and it ripped the blinders off for the whole world to see the systemic racism the Vice President just referred to. The systemic racism is a stain on our nation's soul. <clears throat> the knee on the neck of justice for black Americans. Profound fear and trauma. The pain, the exhaustion and black and brown Americans experience every single day. So while the tone may be different from the previous administration, the politics around police reform in this country have not really changed too much, Lindsay. Uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that was passed in the House, only one Republican supported it when it was passed in the House. Right now, it is deadlocked in the Senate. Tonight, we are learning a bipartisan talk. Senator Tim Scott, Senator Cory Booker, two out of the three black senators are trying to come together to figure out if there is a pathway forward for police reform in this country. But tonight, there's also frustration with even the White House. President Joe Biden, he abandoned the idea of creating a police oversight commission after talking to civil rights leaders. There's questions on whether or not he can be doing more rather than just expressing support for legislation. So here in front of Black Lives Matter Plaza, you have activists, you have supporters, you have protesters gathering here. While they are 
exhaling tonight, they're also taking another deep breath in. They're holding their breath and they're asking themselves, when will the policies of this nation reflect the words that are painted on this very street? The words that Black Lives Matter, Lindsay. And meanwhile, I can't help but notice the, the party-like festive atmosphere. Some people were literally just dancing in the streets just over your shoulders there, Rachel. I want to bring it back to President Biden again, because he did weigh in earlier today, even before the verdict was reached. And he also spoke with the Floyd family after the verdict. Talk about those moments. He did. He spoke to George Floyd's family just yesterday. President Joe Biden said he wanted to wait until the jury was sequestered to do so. He said he wasn't really planning on sharing it, but George Floyd's brother shared the fact that he called him to express his remorse for the death of George Floyd. Uh, his brother said that he said that he knew what it was like. Uh, he felt like the president knew what it was like to lose someone. Obviously, President Joe Biden has dealt with loss uh, in his family as well. But again, this is something that deeply affected President Joe Biden and and he he said today just before the verdict was read hours before the verdict was read that he hopes that the jury reaches the right decision and, and clearly today he believes that justice was served by that guilty verdict but again the question of whether or not there is going to be more change and so today President Biden reiterating what we've heard from a lot of black Americans so far that real change real justice is not going to just come from one verdict that it's much larger Larger than that, that it's going to come from actual legislative change, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Studd, our thanks to you. And we are joined now by Senator Tina Smith of Minnesota. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, first, just tell me your personal reaction as you heard the verdict read this afternoon. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, you know, I think that my reaction was so similar to people all across Minnesota and um, all across this country. I used to work in City Hall, so I was um, frequently in that big plaza, right where um, all those uh, folks were gathered waiting for to hear the, the verdict. And there's this sort of palpable sense of, you know, I, I, I want to trust that this system is going to deliver justice, but I'm so fearful that it won't. So, of course, there was a huge sigh of kind of exhale and, and, and breath released when we heard that uh, former police officer Derek Chauvin was going to be um, is convicted on all three charges. But then immediately you start to think about how this is, as Vice President Harris says, this is a measure of justice, but it is about accountability in one case. It is not about addressing the systemic problems that we have with policing and public safety and criminal justice and the systemic racism that I was heartened to hear both uh, Vice President Harris and President Biden speak about just a moment ago. And of course, it's been nearly a year since George Floyd's death. What does this guilty verdict mean for both the state of Minnesota and, and for the country? Well, I think that it means that in this one case, we have accountability. But the question is, where are we going to take this um, this movement for social justice that was unleashed, that was sparked by this tragic murder? Where are we going to take that spark? Where will it lead us? Will it lead us finally to a place in this country where we are truly not only seeing the systemic racism, but then we are prepared to take action to address it. And I know that that is the question um, on the minds of so many Minnesotans today. It's the question on my mind. We have the power to change the system, to change the laws that make it possible for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Dante Wright to be murdered in the face with, by law enforcement. This is the challenge that we have to confront. And I originally was an original co-sponsor of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. I've introduced legislation to help spur innovation in reimagining what public safety can look like at the local level. These are the steps that we need to take in order to change the systems that end up resulting in too many uh, black and brown people, and too many black men in particular, losing their lives. I'd like to piggyback off of that, because as you just mentioned, you sponsored the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in Congress to try to address police reform. Do you think that this verdict today can spur any momentum on that effort? 
Well, you know, I am an optimist. I sometimes say that you can't really serve effectively in the United States Senate if you're not an optimist, if you don't believe that progress is possible. Uh, that's where I'm coming from. I was heartened today to see the statement of uh, Senator Tim Scott, who I know cares deeply about this issue and who also has personally experienced the, um, the, the profiling and the racism that happens too often for black men. Awesome. And the work that I believe can happen if we put aside our partisan difference and we really address the systemic problems there. I have to be optimistic about that. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act will address the challenges that we have holding police officers accountable when there are cases of excessive use of force. And it also sets a much better standard for what excessive force should be. It bans the kinds of chokeholds that we saw. It uh, stops the kind of militarization of our police departments, which um, we, I think, contributes to some of this over-policing and under-protecting that people in communities of color face. So it is the right thing to do. It is the right step in the right direction. It will not solve all problems, as Vice President Harris said, um, but it will put us on the right path. And I believe we need to redouble our efforts to move that piece of legislation through. And to that end, what do you think needs to happen next in order to get bipartisan movement in the Senate so that the reform effort doesn't get stalled again? Well, I think that there are conversations happening right now, and that is a good thing. I am... Um, um, I'm, I'm encouraged to know that there are some good bipartisan conversations happening. Uh, but I also know that in my community, I live only um, a few miles from 38th in Chicago, where George Floyd was murdered and where there is now a gathering of people. You can see on your screen, um, um, uh, I don't want to say celebrating this verdict, but just breathing a sigh of relief from this verdict. You know, they want to see action. They want to see action now. So we have to we have to find a way of moving forward. Senator Tina Smith, our thanks to you. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we are joined now by Minneapolis City Council Member, Mr. Jamal Osman. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. First, just like to start out with the obvious question of your reaction to the verdict and, and what it means for the community as well. It means a lot. We have waited um, for a long time for this. Uh, today, justice has, we, has been served for this community. Have you heard from any community members their particular reaction? Yes, I was there when it was announced right by the court. People were emotional. It was emotional. This was something they have waited for a long time. Justice has been served today, uh, but the work's not done. Police in Minneapolis is broken. And so when you say the work isn't done, what does the city council need to do from a ground grassroots effort uh, with regard to race and policing in Minneapolis? Yes, Minneapolis City Council have a responsibility to come together and make change. We need to make sure we are working together to address this issue, this systematic issue of policing, right? We can be politics at this time. It's time for us to all to come together and work. This should be an example that we should all come together. It shouldn't take one black man death to know that the police is broken. So we have a job to do, and we have to come together and make change. And, and you don't support uh, calls to defund the police. What do you say to those activists who say, but it needs to be overhauled entirely? I, I admire those uh, uh, activists. I want us, all of us activists, the community, to come together and find a solution community safety, safety, public safety uh, option that works for all of us, right? We can't just know, we, we, we will not know uh, where, where we can go. We want to make sure that we're making the right decisions and keeping our community safe at the same time, the most important, making sure that someone like George Floyd or black uh, or brown communities are not getting killed in the community. So those activists, I, I respect them, but I want to make sure we all sitting on the table and find a solution that will all work, that work for us, all of us. Feeling relieved today? Feeling relieved, yes. We waited, we waited many, many months, many months, but justice has been served, and this is an example for all 
Saudi and all United States and all over the world to come together and fight for justice. And today, justice has been served. Mr. Osman, we thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. And now for legal analysis, we turn to Shauna Lloyd, civil rights attorney with the Cochran firm in Florida. Thanks so much for joining us, Shauna. After following this case so closely, what's your reaction to today's verdict? I think my reaction as, as a black and brown person in America, I think that this was a step in the right direction. I think that this was needed for the community and for people in disenfranchised communities that have been seeing this every day. As a civil rights attorney who sees these types of videos every day, it concerns me that we needed the perfect storm that was this case to get this type of a verdict. It took the type of witnesses that had to be there, a 911 dispatcher, an EMT, an MMA fighter. It took a child bystander. It took all of these people and these experts to come together to get this verdict. When I see body cam videos from people that have been hurt and, and abused by officers that haven't passed but have been you know, disfigured, they've been harmed, we don't get anywhere near this level of justice. So although I am, I feel Feel good that the jury was able to come to a conclusion that was supported by the facts, I think that we need to be mindful that this needs to be a lesson that this is happening. The video is there, and we need to see that reflected in the legal system more often, and not just in cases where we have the perfect set of witnesses and the right experts. So I'm, I'm encouraged, but as a civil rights attorney, I definitely am keeping an eye forward on how this actually changes through our legislative and through the laws that are being enacted. Many have made a lot about the fact that the jury deliberated for only 10 and a half hours. Why do you think that they reached this verdict in, in such a relatively short amount of time? Whenever we've gone back to poll juries, the first thing they start with is, you know, do we agree that there's innocent or guilt? So here, clearly, they started without having to have that debate. They clearly each individually came in at a certain set place, and then they had to address charges. So I think that's where you see the short time for deliberation. It seems that they had already come in similarly situated with each other's opinions, and then they were going through the charges. This was, of course, a diverse jury with five men, seven women, six white, six black or multiracial members. Uh, do you think that the jury makeup may have made a difference here? Absolutely. I think whenever you're looking at a jury that's as diverse as this one is, and everything from age to race, socioeconomic, background, profession, I think what you see is you come to consensuses that are more reflective of the general population, of the environment that we're in, because you have a diverse set of persons that are coming to make this decision. I think it's why it's so important that each person participate in the jury duty process and that they do partake in it, because it is critical to have voices from different backgrounds deciding all manner of cases, especially ones that come down to these types of criminal cases and civil rights violations. Walk us through what happens next during the sentencing phase, and how much prison time do you think that Chauvin might get? Well, now what we're going to see is we're going to see the state arguing for what they've already requested, which is an upward departure. Essentially, what they would like to see is these aggravating factors that they've laid out, the fact that this crime was perpetrated in front of a minor, the fact that it was perpetrated by someone who had a higher duty, a fiduciary duty, and was in a position of trust, the fact that he was in a position of vulnerability, he was handcuffed. You're going to see them argue and write this brief addressing why these factors should cause for an upward departure of the time that we've been talking about. The maximum sentence that the judge could award would be 40 years. It's going to be at the judge's discretion, because Chauvin had the right to have a jury determine, but he waived that right and gave it to the judge. So we'll see the judge make a determination on how much more time. Do I think we're going to see a max penalty? I don't think so in this particular case. Judge Cahill seems to be fair, and he seems to be a little bit more even-handed. So I think you are going to see a departure, but I don't think you'll see the max penalty. And lastly, as a civil rights attorney, what impact, if any, do you think that this verdict could have on policing in America and accountability for police officers? I think, and I and I, I think and hope that this brings a lot more um, attention to training 
to hiring, to paying attention whether uh, these type of infractions have happened and how they're treated once it's happened. When we have an officer that has um, an excessive use of force, that should demand something different. I also hope to see that this also impacts the laws surrounding police immunity and how they're treated when there are these levels of infractions. This is something that I think will see changes. I think it also brings change to law enforcement in and of itself. The ability for officers to stand together one, with one another, with other good officers, because we have plenty to say, these actions are wrong and I will not stand by it just because we share the same badge. I think that's going to be vitally important as we go forward looking at these cases and the effects overall coming from this case. Shauna Lloyd, we thank you so much for your time tonight, your insight throughout the trial. Thank you, Lindsay. And reaction is pouring in from across the country. Take a listen. Tonight, the crowd outside Cup Foods in Minneapolis erupting in cheers as they learned of Derek Chauvin's conviction in George Floyd's death. At the U.S. Capitol, members of the Congressional Black Caucus clasping hands as they listened to the verdict. The disturbing video of Chauvin with his knee on Floyd's neck as Floyd told officers he could not breathe stunned the world. The Memorial Day incident then inciting outrage with people from various races and backgrounds taking to the streets. In the nation's capital and across the country last summer, scenes of protesters face down in silence, remembering the 46-year-old father. The Black Lives Matter movement seeing a resurgence. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! And from Los Angeles to Phoenix, Orlando to New York City, demonstrators demanding justice for Floyd, but also for other African Americans who've died in police custody. At the Brooklyn Memorial Service, his brother Terrence telling our David Muir his family appreciated the diversity seen among demonstrators. When you looked out into that crowd and you saw that sea of faces, black, white, Asian American, Latino, what did you make of it? I just knew my brother, my brother was proud. And I know the whole Floyd family was proud of that. Because we all standing together. We all standing together for the cause of justice. In September of last year, that intersection near where Floyd was arrested renamed George Floyd Square. Let's bring in ABC News contributor LZ Granderson. LZ, thanks so much for joining us. Been asking everybody the same question tonight. First, let me just get your reaction to the verdict. Um, you know, it's muted. It's muted because there was a video that literally had the murder caught on tape, on camera. And so it was very difficult to deny that 10-minute moment with George Floyd and, and officer, former officer Chauvin. But the reason why it's muted is because I'm also reminded of what the police department said that day, soon thereafter. What they said was George Floyd experienced a medical incident and that he died. When you go back and you read that initial statement, which is about 200 words, there is no mention of the witnesses who were asking uh, Mr. Chauvin to remove his knee from Mr. Floyd's neck. There's no mention that Mr. Chauvin's knee was even on Mr. Floyd's neck. So my reaction is muted because I know how lucky we are to get here. We're lucky that that 17-year-old girl's phone had enough charge to capture that moment. We're lucky she went to the store that day. We're lucky she went to that store at that moment. What if she had decided to go earlier? We may not have had any of this. So it's muted because I have relief that there is a guilty charge, a guilty verdict, but I also remember what could have happened had that video not been captured. And today you penned an op-ed in the LA Times where you said, quote, a guilty verdict in the Chauvin trial won't be enough for real progress. What does real progress look like to you? Real progress is when we have an officer on trial without a video going viral, without protesters. Real progress is when the police is actually able to make sure that the bad officers get off of the force, get off of our streets before they get to a point in which they encounter a George Floyd. So real progress is actually the good police officers intervening to save George Floyd's life. When we get to that point in terms of law enforcement and the way we talk about criminal justice, then we'll see real progress, in my opinion. And you 
also touch upon the important role cell phone videos have played in providing us a, a view into interactions with police. But despite all of that, you say this case energized a movement for police reform and justice that could no longer be silenced. But we did not arrive here by design. If anything, the design was to avoid this moment. How does this country go about having significant systemic change? Well, first, it starts with us on an interpersonal level. You know, many families will be discussing this case, will be discussing this trial and the events of it. I will add that this incident, that this day of May 2020 is still happening in the sense that we have other officers that need to also go through uh, uh, their court hearings and court proceedings in a trial. We also have to understand, you know, how exactly did that press release get out in the first place? considering the number of witnesses that were there who saw Derek Chauvin put his knee on George Floyd's neck, and yet there's no mention of any of that in the initial report or in the initial statement. So it first begins with an interpersonal sort of looking at what happened and how you feel about it. And then I would encourage people who are still confused, who are still upset, or worse yet, who think we can now move on, I would encourage you to do things to educate yourself. Read the new Jim Crow. Watch the 13th. Go out of your comfort zone to learn more about this because it is imperative that you educate yourself so that when things like this occur again, you're not blindsided by the dynamics. You actually have information and have more experience in understanding what to look out for. So it begins at home. It begins with us interpersonally. I know that you say your reaction is muted uh, to, to the verdict. I'm curious if you feel hopeful at all about the potential for change in this moment. Well, the one thing that I'm holding on to, even though I recognize that because of the video, they had really no choice, um, seeing the good officers be willing to call out the actions of a bad officer. My hope, really my prayer, is that this becomes a trend, that this catches on. Because then we can start talking about establishing trust between law enforcement and the communities in which they serve. But right now, as long as we still think it's us versus them, and again, when you look at that initial statement made by the police department, it feels very much like that. As long as it feels that way, it's difficult to establish trust. So my hope is that the parade of officers who are willing to come forward and say that it's not proper police conduct, they keep that energy and that it catches fire and that other police departments also have those moments. Because no one, not good cops, not citizens, no one wants to deal with this again. But the only way we can start to avoid it is by getting those Derek Chauvins out of the police departments. LZ Granderson, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And when we come back, our continuing coverage of the verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial. Stay with us. We are standing by to speak with one of George Floyd's brothers and monitoring the reaction coming in across the country. We'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source.
Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. the scene at George Floyd Square, the moment that Derek Chauvin verdict was read, that intersection at the corner of 38th in Chicago has been blocked by barricades since the death of George Floyd. It's been a sight of tears, you can hear them there, and indignation. But today, it is a place of jubilation. And for more reaction, we want to now bring in Terrence Floyd, brother of George Floyd. Terrence, we thank you so much for your time and being here. I'm glad you pulled down the mask, because when you had it on, you said, I have a big smile on. And so we couldn't see that uh, initially. Just your reaction and the family's reaction as the verdict came in. Oh, man, it was relief. Relief. Because, you know, the, this, this, these 11 months, man, just just been a lot on us. Mentally, physically, spiritually, there's been a lot on us. And to see history being made with those three counts guilty, it was, it was, it was wonderful. It was... Your family had really named it and claimed it, so to speak, early on, though. Were you expecting this outcome? Me, me, Percy, I have, I have my doubts because of history repeating itself. But um, it, was, it, was a, it was a moment in time, uh, I, I would say, when we came down here, maybe a week into us being, us being down here, I started to have like a, a, a peaceful, calm spirit about it. And it, it was like, something good gonna come out of this. And um, it did. And President Biden spoke to some of your family members yes. earlier today. Uh, what was their reaction to getting that call from him? I, I would say, you know, it was more so they were they were happy because they, they were they were grateful for the support from him. You know, because it's, it's one thing to to get Congress people or mayors or somebody, but when you get the president behind you and. and Supporting you, that's that's a wonderful feeling. And from the cheers to change, what's next? What do you hope will, especially in name, memory, honor of your brother, will actually be tangible change or legislation that comes out of this? Uh, you know, of course, of course, the bill, the George Floyd bill, the policing act. We want that passed. And then, and besides that, you know, it, it's it's changed for for our culture. It's changed for America. But we need to continue that change by, by unifying and, and, you know, loving one another and, and being, just being peaceful. And, and, and oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. It's just knowing that we're all one. We're all a human race. We don't need the equality. We have to be equal. You know, we can't be fighting one another. It got to be peaceful and, and get along. A lot of people are happy, but some have said that they still plan to demonstrate and, and take to the streets. What would you say to those who may have some aggression? I, I would say, you know, you have, every, you have every right to have your aggression, but channel it a different way. You 
you know, don't, don't, don't challenge it and be destructive. Challenge it and be, and be productive. That's what, that's, that's what I got to say on that. Because I can't, I can't change what you feel. If you feel that, that's what you feel. But I can, I can tell you to change it, channel it a different way. Lastly, we've heard so much about your brother being a mama's boy, gentle giant, big Floyd. How would you hope that people remember him? <laughs> Just as that. Gentle giant. I'm, I'm a, ah, they're going to remember him as Floyd, uh, 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 gentle giant. Me and my family, we're going to remember him as Perry. Because remember him as Perry, from my, from, from my experience, is remembering my father. Because my, my brother was my father's uh, namesake, George Perry Floyd Sr. So remember me, I'm going to remember him, Perry, my brother. You did it, man. We did it. I'm proud of you. I'm going to miss you, but I'm proud of you. And as Gianna said, do you feel that your brothers changed the world? Of course. Of course. And it's, it's history because as, as you, they, they people see, you know, you had Reverend Al Sharpton and you had uh, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson, and they've been fighting for equality and against police brutality for years. You know, for, for this moment, for them to be still here to witness this monumental moment, yeah, he, he changed. He definitely changed the world. Terrence Floyd, so appreciate your time and, and talking with us tonight. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. All right. Stay with us for much more coverage of the verdict and the aftermath straight ahead. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you the reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Sunny, can you take... I'm Lindsay Davis. Welcome back. Thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm here in Minneapolis covering the reaction to the Derek Chauvin guilty verdict. 
But first, we are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Police in Long Island, New York, are investigating a deadly supermarket shooting. One person was killed and two were wounded. Authorities say the suspect was a former employee. Around 200 customers were inside at the time of the shooting. After the incident, nearby communities went on lockdown. The suspect was arrested after a manhunt. With more than half of American adults receiving at least one COVID dose, the race is on to vaccinate the rest of those who are eligible. About 20% of adults say they don't want a shot. This as EU regulators find a possible link between the Johnson & Johnson shot and a rare blood clot. But they say the benefits outweigh the risks. As you know, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine remains on pause inside the U.S. President Biden says he's willing to compromise to get bipartisan support for his infrastructure project, but he's so far revealing zero hints on what he would lose from his proposal to win GOP support. Biden told Republicans he wants to see a GOP counteroffer by mid-May and that a corporate tax rate increase will be key for paying for it all. And now to that guilty verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial. Guilty on all counts. The verdict quickly reverberating from the courthouse to the streets of Minneapolis and streets across our country. Our Alex Perez reports on the verdict and what comes next. Members of the jury, I will now read the verdicts. The jury deliberating just 10 and a half hours and with the nation watching, Judge Peter Cahill reading their unanimous verdict. We the jury in the above entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. Verdict count two. We the jury in the above entitled matter as to count two, third degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. Verdict count three. We the jury in the above entitled matter as to count three, second degree manslaughter, culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk, find the defendant guilty. The jury of seven women and five men, which included six people of color, stayed late last night and came in early this morning. They worked swiftly and didn't send out a single question during their deliberations. Are these your verdicts? So say you one, so say you all. Yes. 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 In Houston, George Floyd's family members watching as the verdict was read. Find the defendant guilty. Find the defendant guilty. Yeah. Here in Minneapolis, other family members erupting. And in George Floyd Square, near where he was murdered, jubilation. The prosecution built their case around that video seen around the world, the 9 minutes and 29 seconds that sparked a racial reckoning movement, telling jurors, believe your own eyes. It's exactly what you knew. It's what you felt in your gut. It's what you now know in your heart. This wasn't policing. This was murder. The teenager who shot that video, Darnella Frazier, taking the stand, testifying off camera. Like so many eyewitnesses, she's still haunted by what she saw. When I look at George Floyd, I look at, I look at my dad. I look at my brothers, I look at my cousins, my uncles, because they are all black. I look at how that could have been one of them. It's been nights. I stayed up apologizing and, and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more. Fair or firm. A dozen law enforcement witnesses, including the Minneapolis chief of police, testified against Derek Chauvin. To continue to apply that level of force to a person proned out, handcuffed behind their back, um, that that in no way, shape, or form is anything that um, uh, is by policy, and is not part of our training, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. The prosecution's medical experts were blunt. A healthy person subjected to what Mr. Floyd was subjected to would have died as a result of what he was subjected to. Chauvin opting not to take the stand in his own defense. I will invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege today. His attorney calling just seven witnesses to the prosecution's 38. They sought to convince jurors that George Floyd's heart disease and drug use led to his death, not Chauvin's knee on his neck. 
Derek Chauvin did exactly what he had been trained to do over the course of his 19-year career. The use of force is not attractive, but it is a necessary component of policing. But the jury was not convinced, and tonight we have their judgment. What Derek Chauvin did to George Floyd wasn't policing, it was murder. The former officer put in handcuffs himself as he was let out of court. Our thanks to Alex, and for more on this guilty verdict, we're joined by ABC News contributor Brian Buckmeyer, host of the Law and Crime Network. Thanks so much for joining us in person here, Brian. Uh, so I've been asking everybody the same question. Was this the reaction, the verdict that you were expecting? Kind of yes and no. The lawyer in me expected it. The lawyer in me knows the laws, the facts, the how did it all fit. But the man inside of me was skeptical because we've been here before where there was an officer who we expected to be convicted but didn't. So there was a bit of reservation, but when the verdict came out, it fit what my mind and, and my legal expertise expected. Hey, you and I were discussing this earlier. You talked about how there was a lot of paperwork. What do you think was the difficult aspect, and were you surprised uh, that it took just over 10 hours to, to come to the verdict? Yeah, there was a lot for the jury to dig into, and when we were talking about this, we talked about the fact that no one goes to jury school to understand how uh, the facts and the law should the come together, and the terminology, substantial force, intervening factor, and so for that, I thought it might take some time, and so I was a little bit surprised that we're here today talking about a verdict I would have expected tomorrow, maybe even the day after. And there were more than a dozen complaints against Derek Chauvin. Uh, the, the prosecution was very clear at the outset to say that this is not the state versus police. Um, but do you think that, does the Minneapolis Police Department get a pass here as far as continuing to keep him on uh, despite all of these articles against him? So I think the prosecution did a smart and strategic job of, of kind of parsing through what they wanted to argue and what they didn't want to take on. Taking on the entire Minneapolis Police Department is a hard task uh, to do. So they made it very narrow and only took on Derek Chauvin. But I don't think this gives them a pass. And it's something that Eric Nelson said, that the reasonable officer wouldn't do this in broad daylight. The reasonable officer wouldn't do this with so many cameras on them. But Derek Chauvin did that. And I think he did that because he believed he could get away from this. He could get away from doing this to George Floyd, and I think that's what we really have to attack. Why did Derek Chauvin believe he could do this in broad daylight with so many witnesses, so many cameras? That's a systemic racism. That's a systemic problem that needs to be addressed. History shows, though, that it is difficult to charge and convict police officers. Do you feel in any way that this case changes that? I think it does change to some degree, because now we have a model. Now we have an example that we can point to and say, this is egregious police brutality that we will convict of a top count, not just manslaughter, but murder. Uh, and I think that's going to help prosecutions, prosecutors sorry, find the roadmap to getting that conviction. I think it's very similar to what we saw with Harvey Weinstein, where it was hard to get someone convicted of a crime if an individual didn't report right away. Now there's a roadmap. Now there's an understanding. This is criminal. This is not. And this will get you convicted for murder. Brian Buckmeyer, we've been, it's been a privilege to have you holding our hands along throughout this entire trial. We, we appreciate it. And now we're going to go to correspondent Rachel Scott, who is once again at Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C. Rachel. Hey, Lindsay. You know, we were out here as that verdict was being read in the courtroom today, and I remember watching it on my phone, and I turned around, and I saw this man, Pastor Devin Turner, and he fell to his knees. You fell to your knees when you heard that guilty verdict being read. I just want you to take me back to that moment. What was going through your mind when you heard those words, guilty? You know, uh, Rachel, I, I felt elation. I felt joy. I felt peace. I felt relief. Uh, that, that, that God shined upon us and gave us justice and that God spared us from an adverse reaction to this, this peaceful environment where music's playing here in the nation's capital. It just felt good. I was moved to tears. Uh, I shouted hallelujah because, you know, I, I'm a black man, I'm a preacher, and I've been profiled by police driving, pulled over, I'm in a suit, asked me to get out of my vehicle, want to check my vehicle. I have twin sons at home. I've had the talks with my 10-year-old twin sons. 
Here's what happened to Tamir Rice. Um, George Floyd. Um, this is why daddy responds this way when police pull over. And for some people, it's like, my black skin is more dangerous than a, a gun. They, they look at my skin and will say, oh, he must be a problem. And so I felt the peace of God that the Lord answered my prayers and so many others' prayers that we got justice. It doesn't bring George back. It doesn't bring Ahmaud Arbery back, Breonna Taylor, Emmett Till. It doesn't bring back so many black lives we've lost. But it's a step in the right direction. I just felt that peace and I felt elation for them. This is a really personal moment for a lot of black Americans in this country. Did you see yourself in George Floyd, in his story? I identify with George Floyd because I've been profiled and harassed by police before. Uh, my parents are from Mississippi. My mother drank from a colored only, only fountain. Um, I remember visiting in Mississippi family and being harassed by white police officers. Uh, like I said, even here as an adult, um, it could have been me. I could have been cuffed. I could have been pinned to the ground. I could have been choked. And so George Floyd represents all of us as black people. And I think that's why there's such a response of elation and joy amongst the black community and people that empathize with the black community. It is a sense of something that I've gotten from talking to people out here that it doesn't matter. And that's what you said to me. It doesn't matter necessarily what you do. You could be in a suit. You could have an occupation. You can rise to a certain level. But there still is a history of systemic racism that prevails in this country. You were taking a moment and you were exhaling. You were on your knees, you were crying tears of joy. But in a lot of ways, it feels like you're still holding your breath. Holding your breath for real change. What does that look like? You know, um, we say, we celebrate the day, but tomorrow there's more work to be done. So right now I'm taking in, like so many other people out here smiling, I'm taking in the fact that, uh, yes, 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 God, yes. But we know tomorrow we have to deal with Adam Toledo. You know, we have to deal with Dante Wright. We have to deal with uh, an off-duty security officer from the Pentagon who shot and killed two black lives here in the D.C. area just a, a week and a half ago. So there's always the work to fight for justice. But it just feels good to take it. I've learned to celebrate the victories along the way because if I look at it too big, Rachel, it's like, well, we haven't made any progress, but we have. It's a step. It's a step. We celebrate these steps toward the ultimate destiny that we hope to achieve in this country. Legislative change. You want to see that as well from lawmakers, from the president. We're just outside the White House. Absolutely. Legislative change. But one thing I've learned is that you can't legislate somebody's heart. Um, if you try to change somebody's habit without their heart changing, You'll find that they just behave in front of you or when the camera's rolling, but when the camera's not around or people aren't watching, when the accountability's not there, they're gonna behave a different way. It's like a child. If a child's heart hasn't changed to know this is wrong and this is right, the child will be obedient in front of their parent. When the parent's not watching, they'll do something else. But if it's ingrained in the child to have integrity and to have a connection to a higher power to say, somebody's always watching me, then I can't do this no matter if I think someone is watching because he's always watching and it doesn't resonate with my heart. So I'm praying for legislation change, but I'm also praying for heart change, that we'll view each other as human beings, that there be one race, the human race, of many different shades and colors, and that we let our diversity bring us together to learn and glean from one another and understand each other's cultures instead of dividing us and saying, I'm better than you because you're different, or you're better than me because you're different. No, we're all made in the image of God, and we all need more love and more peace in our community. So that's what I'm hoping for. Lindsay, certainly a lot of emotions here outside of the White House that we're seeing in the aftermath following that guilty verdict there out of Minnesota. But you heard it straight from Pastor Devin here. What he's hoping for most is not only policy change, but a change in the heart of Americans, Lindsay. Right, as he said, you cannot legislate someone's heart. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you and the pastor as well. And joining us now with more reaction to the verdict is Dr. Tracy Kizzy, a 25-year veteran of the Denver Police Department and co-founder of the Center for Policing Equity, along with Bob Boyce, former NYPD chief of detectives of an ABC News contributor. Bob, we'll start with you. What was your reaction to the verdict? I thought it was a just verdict, and I look at uh, Chief Arandano of the Minneapolis Police Department, some, some really uh, seminal moments within the trial, when he said, and I think he spoke for all law enforcement, this is not our values, these are not our ethics, and he walked away from him, and he said it wasn't our training either. 
So that, that op the optic of that video was just too compelling. The, the jury was never going to listen to any defense argument when you saw what happened there. So I think it's a good day. I'm hoping for a safe night for everybody tonight uh, in the protests and in marches, all these things, so we can come together and go to a better place. And Dr. Kizzy, same question I've been asking everybody tonight as a black woman who worked for decades in law enforcement, your reaction to the verdict? Um, you know, mine was, I think, what you heard in one of your previous interviews, I was holding my breath. Um, we had been here before. And so I was surprised, one, how quickly the verdict came. But I have to agree um, with Bob that, you know, Chief Arredondo did an incredible job of articulating what the sort of ethics are of law enforcement and public safety and how should you be engaging with community. Um, we'll see. We'll see what this does and what this means as we move forward. But again, I was you know, surprised. I can tell you I was relieved. Um, I exhaled like everyone else because I, there was a part of me that I wasn't so sure um, that folks would um, really see what we witnessed almost a year ago, and that is a homicide that occurred in broad daylight. And Dr. Kizzy, staying with you for a moment, the group that you represent now is trying to increase trust between police and minority communities. What's the biggest problem in trying to build up that kind of trust, and, and how do you start to solve that problem? Well, I would say there's probably a new number of problems, so it's not just one. When you talk about trust, it's one, how are you defining that? And what are we expecting when we say we want a trusting relationship? And really the hurdle in doing that is the historical mistrust that is happening and has occurred and some, you know, some spaces it continues. And so it is really historically, how do you begin to act in a way in which people believe what you say and that you truly do want to have change? And when that means that you want to have change, that means not just talking about it, that's being about it. That's how do you move? How do you think about things differently? Um, what does public safety mean? How is it defined? How do you understand it? And how do you understand how others are experiencing it? So the biggest hurdle, one of them, is just the historical mistrust. And how do you begin to move forward with folks who don't want to come to the table and have this conversation because they're, they're exhausted? So it is a lot of that work. And Chief Boyce, during closing arguments, the prosecution emphasized that policing is a noble profession and that Officer Chauvin was an outlier. Why do you feel that that was so important to make that distinction uh, in this case and going forward? Well, the prosecutor clearly said, uh, clearly said this wasn't policing. This was murder. It wasn't policing. Um, being a 35-year veteran and um, I, I work with uh, Tracy in the, in the NYPD, retraining all of our officers in 2014 in the aftermath of Garner, of Eric Garner. So we de-escalation training, all these things. We walked away from this back then. I know it's a process. It's not something you uh, snap your finger and it's over overnight. You have to keep going forward with it, uh, uh, stopping all neck restraints, all these things. It needs to be a na national standards across the board to get this done. It's not an easy process. Hopefully, this is a step forward in that process and, uh, and moving forward and more transparent, more communication, all these things we have to teach and have to demand and accountability. And Bob, we'll stay with you, but the question is really for both of you. We saw the celebrations from the Floyd family and many others across the country. Where do police departments and the communities they serve go from here? And do you expect to see any major changes anytime soon? I do. I've seen some in the last 11, the last 11 months have been just the worst 11 months in, in, uh, that I've seen in American law enforcement. It's been rough. Nobody wants to go through this anymore. Uh, we want we want complete transparency. We want change. We want to work well with our community partners, and we want to put out put out a broad standard that this is a new do, this is a new day, and we're not going to do this anymore. So this is what accountability is all about. And I see something underfoot right now that I'm really encouraging, is that other officers are trained to step in and stop a, a fellow officer from from stepping over that line. That has to happen. We should be we should have been doing this a long time ago. We're doing it now. I was taught in 1983 when I became a police officer, stop your partner from going forward when he's, you know, protect him from the problem, protect a prisoner or whoever you're dealing with in the street. That's individual accountability has to happen. Dr. Kizzy, last same question to you and the final question, do you see that change coming soon? 
Um, it's on the way, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And, and, and Bob has just outlined some of the things that need to happen currently to begin to reduce some of the harms that are happening. But it doesn't get in the way of the real work that needs to be done. And as you think about, you know, not just what do you do, excuse me, with, you know, de-escalation training and those types of things, the real questions on the table is what is the role of law enforcement today? What does it mean to have public safety? And what does that look like? And you find in a lot of cities throughout the country, those are the fundamental questions on the table right now. What is the role for law enforcement? And is there a role for law enforcement? And if so, what does it look like? But really it is community centered and community driven really starting to talk about what public safety means to them and what it means. So again, the work has not ended, it's never ended, and there's still much more to do, but there's absolutely things we can be doing right now. Dr. Tracy Kizzy, Robert Boyce, thank you both for your time. Appreciate your analysis. Thanks so much. And stay with us, much more coverage ahead of the Derek Chauvin verdict and what comes next. guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big, big hug, Richard. We taught all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Welcome back, and for more on the Chauvin verdict, we bring in attorney Lance LaRusso, who's represented dozens of police officers, including a former Atlanta police officer who shot Rayshard Brooks last summer. Thank you so much for joining us again, Mr. LaRusso. Uh, been asking everybody the same question, your reaction to this verdict. You know, it doesn't surprise me that there was a verdict uh, in, of guilty, and I think that the second-degree manslaughter was pretty much a given from some of the early testimony. Uh, the other two, I think, were developed. I think in large part, the jury found extremely dispositive the fact that there was no treatment after George Floyd went limp. And, you know, I'm finding it very hard to believe and listening to all these people talk about this is an example of systemic racism when law enforcement has been condemning this situation roundly since the video came out. Uh, so I think that, you know, we need to take a step back and realize this is not the time to defund law enforcement. It's not the time to reduce the amount of training. We need to find out why this happened in this specific department and recognize this man obviously was an outlier. And some of 
have said that America was on trial in this case, while others, including the prosecutor himself, said that this case was solely about one man, Derek Chauvin, and not about policing. Do you feel that this trial ended up being bigger than just Derek Chauvin? No, I think the prosecutors recognize when you're going to call people like Chief uh, Arondo and you're going to call uh, Investigator Blackwell and other amazing law enforcement officers who work in Minneapolis, and you're going to put them in front of a jury so they can see the professionalism and compassion they have, you can't indict the entire law enforcement uh, department. And I think that it's the same with law enforcement across the United States. Thousands, tens of thousands of law enforcement officers perform their jobs admirably, professionally, and compassionately every day. In law, there's often talk of precedent. You defend police officers in court. Do you think that this case could make your job more difficult or have any impact at all on future cases against police officers? No, I don't. I think that when we look at these situations, we hear, you know, the, the thin blue line and the blue wall of silence. I see people coming out and testifying, my clients testifying against bad police officers all the time. And, you know, this is a Hollywood-driven notion that law enforcement never testifies or never gets rid of bad law enforcement officers. I think juries listen to evidence. I think the juries listen to the evidence. They watch the video. And they said there was no excuse for any use of force especially when George Floyd went limp. And at that point, they decided, I think correctly, that this was completely inappropriate. And I don't know a single law enforcement officer who has supported what Derek Chauvin did. Is there anything that you think or that you hope will come out of this landmark trial? I think one of the things we need to look at is to stop this rush to fire law enforcement officers immediately before you get to do an investigation. There is a case, Garrity versus New Jersey, where law enforcement agencies can force an officer to answer questions. And I still have questions watching that video. Where in the world did Derek Chauvin decide to do that? Where did he learn it? And we heard it wasn't taught in the academy. It wasn't taught by anyone in his department. But we lost the opportunity to make that department better and learn more about where that, that maneuver came from and where his decisions came from, because there was a rush to terminate him immediately. Even if he's going to be charged later, we lost that opportunity. And lastly, you've been in Eric Nelson's shoes in that you represent police officers. How well would you say that he argued Derek Chauvin's case? And would you say that a guilty verdict was inevitable, given the facts? I think the second-degree manslaughter was probably the toughest thing for him to come back. And I, I was not surprised at all when they convicted based on that. Um, I think he was trying to do what he's constitutionally required to do, is to try to raise a reasonable doubt and, as Sandra Day O'Connor said, test the evidence in the crucible of justice. I think he was, you know, recognizing his client came in with a presumption of innocence and there was going to be a lot of evidence that came forward. And the prosecution did an excellent job of constantly hitting the fact that the force at some point was no longer justifiable in any way whatsoever. Lance LaRusso, appreciate your insight and your time with us. Thanks for having me. And stay with us much more on this verdict ahead. We're taking a live look right now at March, a March in New York City. We'll be right back. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. 
What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you the reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone, with Derek Chauvin's guilty verdict today. We take a closer look by the numbers at police killings in America, and just how rare it is for officers to face criminal convictions. About 1,000 people are fatally shot by police each year in the U.S., according to a Washington Post database, which notes that most of the victims were armed and most of these killings are deemed justified. Still, only 140 law enforcement officers nationwide have been charged with murder or manslaughter for on-duty shootings since 2005, according to research from Bowling Green State University. Of those, only 44 officers were convicted for any crime related to the shootings, although some cases are still pending. And since 2005, just seven officers have been convicted of murder. In addition to these cases, at least eight officers have been charged with a crime because of a chokehold death since 2005, again, according to Bowling Green researchers. But of those before today, only two officers had been convicted one for a civil rights violation and another for falsifying reports. Now we know that at least one officer, Derek Chauvin, has been convicted of murder for killing someone with his knee. And we are continuing to follow marches across the country tonight. Looking once again at George Floyd Square right now. Stay with us. We'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! 
Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads. It's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. After ten and a half hours of deliberation, the jury has come to a verdict in the murder trial of Derek Chauvin. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. Convicted on all three charges, he showed no emotion as he was cuffed and taken back into custody. For a high profile case, this is a pretty fast verdict. When the world is watching, the jurors typically want to uh, cross the T's and dot the I's and make it clear to the world that they very carefully considered the evidence. Monday, jurors heard six hours of closing arguments from both sides after nearly three weeks of powerful testimony and supporting evidence. Prosecutors arguing Chauvin's action killed Floyd. The defense hoping to create reasonable doubt, saying his use of force was justified, blaming Floyd's drug and heart issues for his death. Today, we feel a sigh of relief. Still, it cannot take away the pain. A measure of justice isn't the same as equal justice. It was a murder in the full light of day, and it ripped the blinders off for the whole world to see the systemic racism the vice president just referred to. In order to deliver real change and reform, we can and we must do more to reduce the likelihood that tragedies like this will ever happen or occur again. Active shooters devastate communities, but today, that reality came home to Nassau County. Police on Long Island, New York, say they have a suspect in custody following a shooting today at a grocery store. Police on Long Island said a Gabriel DeWitt Wilson walked into an upstairs manager's office at the Stop and Shop in West Hempstead and opened fire with a small handgun. A 49-year-old man was killed. Two other employees of the store were injured. At the time, police said there were a couple hundred shoppers in the store, which Stop and Shop said would remain closed while police investigate. Our members were evacuated out of the back of the store. We're very grateful for that. This gun violence in this country has got to stop. Both my eight-year-old and my 16-year-old sons who are behind me have been targets of racial hate. Parents expressing shock and outrage in Alito, Texas, after the discovery of a Snapchat group made by ninth graders pretending to auction off their black classmates. Christopher Johnson, one of the students mentioned in the chat, told the board they weren't listening. The superintendent or board has not even admitted or apologized to us. Racism is ugly and it hurts everybody involved. Monday morning, Tony Lopez picked up a handful of the hundreds of flyers scattered along roads and school campuses advertising a fake slave auction. That hurt my heart. And every time I bent down to pick it up, I wanted to scream. District police are investigating. Superintendent Susan Bond started the meeting saying they're now planning to reinforce the discipline for racial misconduct with staff, form a trustee listening group, and provide training for parents. We strive every day to be better than we were the day before. Tracking a spring snowstorm. Weather alerts from Texas to New York. More than a foot of snow falling in the Rockies. More than five inches of snow in Denver for the commute home. Several inches of snow expected for upstate New York and northern New England tomorrow. Heavy rain from Philly to New York to Boston. Freeze warnings from Texas to the northeast. Wind chills in the 20s. If you thought flight tickets were a bargain in 2020, you're right. New data from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics reveals the historic low cost for an average ticket in 2020 was just $292, a drop of nearly 19% from the year prior. That's the lowest inflation-adjusted annual fare since record-keeping started. There were also far fewer of us in the air. Just 131 million passengers took to the skies compared to the 331 million 
million the year before. And those affordable flights may stick around a little while longer. United Airlines CEO says he believes prices will stay low for a few more months until business travel bounces back. Welcome back. And now to the latest on the coronavirus pandemic and the growing concern over vaccine hesitancy as the variants spread. And after the CDC imposed that temporary pause on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, today European regulators weighed in saying that the benefits outweigh the risks. The CDC could lift that pause in the U.S. later on this week. Here's ABC's Marcus Moore. Growing reports tonight that demand for vaccines is slowing down as thousands of appointments go unfilled across the country. How critical is it that, that people get vaccinated? It is absolutely critical. We are, at a, we are in a race against the virus and against time to reach herd immunity before this virus mutates into something that can defeat our vaccine. This site in Dallas can do 12,000 vaccinations a day, but on some days they're doing as few as 4,000. 44% of the counties in this country are still battling high community spread of coronavirus, but many rural areas are seeing lower turnout for the vaccine. Just like many other places across the United States, uh, largely rural populations are just not coming out to get vaccinated. And vaccine hesitancy is higher in underserved communities hit hardest by the virus. I'm just waiting more or less to see what is going on and then I could decide whether or not if I want to take it. A recent poll revealing a political divide too. 45% of Republicans said they do not plan to get a COVID-19 vaccine right now compared to 27% of Americans overall. All right. Doctor and Republican Congressman Andy Harris giving shots in his home district in Maryland. You should be getting the vaccine because the benefits outweigh the risks and we need to make sure that we protect our most vulnerable uh, people in the United States. Lindsay, there is news tonight on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that's on pause here in the U.S. European officials are recommending a warning for that vaccine similar to one they issued for AstraZeneca. Regulators there found a link to extremely rare blood clots but have concluded that the benefits of taking the vaccine outweigh the risks. Uh, back here in this country, a CDC advisory panel is expected to meet once again on Friday. Lindsay. Marcus, our thanks to you. Today, yet again, there was another deadly shooting in our country, this time at a supermarket outside of New York City, sparking an anxious manhunt. One person killed, two wounded at a stop and shop in Nassau County with some 200 customers inside. Our Janae Norman has the very latest on the investigation into what happened. Tonight, grocery shoppers with their hands in the air. Another community gripped by the fear of a workplace shooting. I'm near the supermarket. There's cops everywhere. This time at this stop and shop on New York's okay. Long Island. Well, we're now being told three people were shot. Police identifying the alleged suspect as 31-year-old Gabriel DeWitt Wilson, who worked at the supermarket. Just after 11 a.m., officials say he burst into a second floor office armed with a handgun and shot two employees. Then turning to the manager's office, killed him. Our members were evacuated out of the back of the store. We're very grateful for that. This gun violence in this country has got to stop. Students on lockdown at nearby schools. Families in the area told to shelter in place. Police apprehending Wilson nearby. We do not have a motive at this time. And now that Wilson's in custody, the search for a motive begins. Although this appears to be a workplace shooting, it's still unclear why he opened fire, killing one and injuring two others. Lindsay. Janae, our thanks to you. And when we come back, we'll bring you headlines from around the world. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you believe we believe us? The reality is our country can collapse from within. Why you see the white power movement on the march. You will not 
Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Doing good things for good people. He'll walk a mile in their shoes, <laughs> then get him a brand spanking new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. You name it, whoa, whoa, whoa. he'll try. <laughs> Even if it breaks him. Bobby Bones, they're trying to break you. Oh, great. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. Tonight. Thank you, David, for showing us the love. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. Welcome back. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. The president of Chad is dead just hours after winning a disputed election. The leader is a Western ally killed on the front lines during clashes with Islamist rebels. The circumstances revealed by state TV and Chad remain murky. He led the nation for more than three decades. Ecuadorian officials say those two little girls ages three and five who were dropped over a border wall into the U.S. have been reunited with families. U.S. border agents cared for the pair for more than two weeks after they were found in a remote spot in New Mexico. They have now reunited with their parents in New York. All Olympic and Paralympic athletes will be tested daily for COVID as the Tokyo Games loom closer. The Japanese government making the announcement as they try to salvage the competition as cases continue to surge around the world. Their hope is that these tests will help them sniff out infections early. And now to the coronavirus crisis in the world's second most populous nation, India. The country experiencing a brutal spring surge that is threatening to cripple their health care system. ABC's James Longman is tracking it all. Yeah, hi, Lindsay. It was perhaps only a matter of time before coronavirus really started to overwhelm India, but now it does seem that that time has come. It's a country of nearly 1.4 billion people, and it's reporting over 250,000 new cases a day, some 15 million in total, and it's so far reported around 180,000 deaths. But the true numbers are likely much higher. A number of towns and cities are reporting far larger numbers of dead than the official national statistics show. And this new surge is only just 
just getting started. But it goes on like this. According to one study, they could be seeing more than 5,000 deaths a day by next month. Now, the difference with last year is that India enforced a strict lockdown back then. It did struggle, like much of the rest of the world, but it does seem to have escaped a worse fate. But now it seems they were unprepared, and the second wave seems to be spreading a far more contagious variant, with the health system essentially collapsing in parts of the country. Demands for testing are now three times higher than what they were last year, and these massive delays have pushed the country to breaking point. Hospitals are full. We've seen report after report of desperate people trying to get their relatives seen by doctors, but failings. The ICUs are full, and the dead are piling up at crematoriums and graveyards. Now, a huge issue does seem to be the lack of oxygen, and the government is now rerouting supplies to hospitals from industry to try and fill the gap. They're using India's huge rail network and trucks with tankers to ferry oxygen around the country. Authorities have now implemented lockdowns to try and get the situation under control, like in the capital, New Delhi. But in some parts of the country, election rallies and religious gatherings are still going ahead. They are clearly potential super spreader events. Its slow vaccination drive does also seem to be contributing to the surge. Fewer than 8% of its huge population has received one dose of a vaccine. And there are concerns about supplies in the weeks ahead. This is, of course, a tragic situation for India, but it's also very dangerous more broadly. As one doctor said, if India doesn't get COVID under control, the world doesn't get COVID under control. Lindsay. Dangerous for all of us, James. Thank you. Some popular vacation spots are offering visitors a COVID-19 vaccine as they step off the plane. This after airline ticket sales rose to 82% from February to March. ABC's transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has more. The tourist mecca known for its crystal clear turquoise waters now wants to be known for three V's. Visit, vaccinate, vacation. Offering vaccines to visitors. 1.7 million people visited the Maldives in 2019. That fell to under half a million last year. Now they are hoping people will stay for several weeks to get two doses of the vaccine while staying at one of the 500 resorts and guest houses open right now. The offer won't kick in until all of its residents are vaccinated. Right now, more than half of the country has received the vaccine. And other destinations have the same idea, even in the U.S. Nevada has already vaccinated more than 57,000 visitors. And Alaska proposing to start offering vaccines in June at four major airports to anyone visiting. You come to visit Alaska, you get a shot. We'll have things set up at the airport and we'll help you out. So it's uh, probably another good reason to come to the state of Alaska in the summer. They say there are plenty of doses to go around, but the proposal needs to be approved by state legislators. Vaccines are getting a lot of play in the travel industry. Some of the biggest cruise lines like Royal Caribbean, Celebrity, Norwegian and Virgin Voyages all requiring vaccinations before boarding Caribbean cruises this summer. In a blustery Minneapolis, those cruises are tempting. Our thanks to Gio for that. The New Jersey couple going the extra mile to help their community. Will Gans brings us their story. We had to do something. We're going to do what we can where we are right here, and we're going to try and make a difference. Joe Cicchetti and Shirley Lindbergh are the New Jersey couple giving their neighbors a lift, literally. We'll drive down the street. And people will point and look and smile and, you know, clap and everything. It's like, it's great. Joe's Covey car, as it's called, might look a little funny, but it's a car on a serious mission. Maybe we could just give people rides to their vaccine appointments mm -hmm. and, you know, then we'll be helping out everybody. Joe and Shirley providing vulnerable neighbors a ride to and from their vaccine appointments. Every shot counts towards uh, you know, shortening this pandemic. Miss Cindy is one of Joe's satisfied customers. Joe and Shirley offering their services totally free of charge. But Miss Cindy had other ideas. She had a little piece of paper and she gave it to me and she says, hey, give this to Shirley. And we opened up, we got home and it was six chocolate kisses in there. <laughs> And was so sweet. Cindy already booked a return trip in Joe's Covey car for her second shot. Joe and Shirley are both retired and both fully vaccinated, providing an important service in an area with little public transportation and to folks who aren't able to use Uber. We're kind of limited we can do because it's just we're a two man show. That's it. This is this is the whole uh, the whole corporation. That's right the here. whole operation. <laughs> the whole operation is being Shirley. It says. Joe accepting appointments on Facebook. We flat out booked the whole week. 
and next week we're looking the same way. Booked solid, but the couple says they're happy to provide a dose of inspiration after such a difficult year. And a car with 140,000 miles on it, and we can make a difference with that. Anybody can make a difference. Making a difference for us all. Our thanks to Will for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Emotional reactions to today's verdict coming in from across the country. You can see joy, shock, grief, so much more on the faces of so many Americans. Look at those eyes right there. Tonight's images of the day. And that is our show for tonight from here in Minneapolis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. We leave you tonight with a shot of George Floyd Square. Good night.